Time have arrived for uh, Monday, May 19th, Finance Committee. It being 7 o'clock, I hereby call the meeting to order. Councilors, before we get into the agenda item, we have uh, three guests joining us tonight in the chamber. Uh, two Brockton residents that are both seniors at Southeastern Regional Vocational High School, Technical High School, and really, uh, really assets for the City of Champions and City of Brockton. Uh, Adrian Niles, who uh, again is a senior, uh, he just recently became a first place gold medal award at the Boston area of the NAACP ACT hyphen SO, which Excellent. is Afro Academic Cultural Technical and Scientific Olympics. He also uh, placed first place award at the South Shore Regional Science Fair and also was a top finisher at the Mass State Science and Engineering Fair at MIT. Uh, Adrian, if you could come forward. And we're also joined by his colleague, senior at Southeastern, Nigel Dennis, who also, in his own right, got a first place gold medal, again, at the Boston area of the NAACP AXO, Afro Academic, Cultural, Technical, Technological and Scientific Olympics his second place award at the South Shore Regional Science Fair competition. He was very successful recently at the Mass State Science and Engineering Fair at MIT. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us here tonight. We're gonna to give you a round of applause. <laughs> we, are, uh, we are also fortunate to have Patricia Monteith. Uh, Pat's a, a Brockton resident, and during her retirement years, she's. Uh, dedicating and mentoring at South Shore. And these were two of her students that she mentored. So Pat, we want to thank you for everything you're doing. <laughs> Guys, if you wanted to uh, address the council sitting as finance committee to explain uh, what it is, and then we also have some citations on behalf of the council we'd like to give both of you. If you want to go to the microphone and... and First of all, thank you for joining us here tonight. Welcome. Thank you for having me. My name is Adrian Isles, and then last year I built the Self Balance and People Mover, and then I figured out it had potential to do way much more. So then I equipped it with safety features that assist the disabled and elderly. Those safety features are proximity sensors, which are located in the back, and then automatic front and headlights, and then you also have foot steering. So say if a person had one arm or no arms at all, they can use the foot steering instead of staying with the actual um, handlebar. So those are some safety features that I added. You can see my board that I had in my competitions. And that shows you everything about my project. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Nigel Dennis, and I made the Navi smartwatch. And I made it so it give you a utility device to help my daily life. So I made a calculator, um, a clock that tells the time and date, a GPS, a radio, so a couple of stopwatches, and mostly anything that helped me out. And pretty much, I had this idea ever since freshman year, mm -hmm. and I started and I started working on it during my during my sophomore year up till now, and I'm almost getting complete now. Um, that's how much I got far. <laughs> you you both are just extraordinary and, and great assets, and you make us proud. So thank you. Thank you. So I also uh, forgot to indicate the fact that both of these gentlemen received first place gold medals. They have been awarded uh, an all expense paid trip this summer to Las Vegas for the next competition. So we wish you well. We also have um, some, some citations and uh, I'd like to read them. Uh, City of Brockton official citation, be it known that the Brockton City Council hereby extends its congratulations to Nigel Dennis. Uh, and also to, uh, to, to Adrian as well, a Brockton resident and senior at Southeastern Regional Vocational Technical High School in recognition of your first place gold medal award, Boston area of the NAACP AXO, second place award, the South Shore Regional Science Fair competition, and your recent success at MIT at the Mass State Science. Be it further known that the City Council extends best wishes for continued success, that this citation be duly signed by the President of the City Council and attested to, and a copy therefore transmitted by the clerk of the City Council. Signed by myself, Robert Sullivan, Council President, attested by Anthony J. Zioli, who is our City Clerk, and it's dated May 19th of 2014. Um, we have one for both of you. Uh, and again, we want to thank you. We also have a third for your mentor, uh, Patricia Monteith. Uh, Ms. Patricia Monteith, a Brockton resident, in recognition of your dedication and mentoring of students at Southeastern Regional Vocational Technical High School and the, their recent successes at the Boston area NAACP AXO South Shore Regional Science Fair and Mass State Science and Engineering, Engineering Fair at MIT competitions. Be it further known that the City Council extends best wishes for continued success, 
This citation be duly signed by the President of the City Council and attested to and a copy therefore transmitted by the Clerk of the City Council, offered by myself and signed by the City Clerk. Thank you, Pat. Madam Clerk, agenda item number one, please. Reappointment. Robert W. Bishop of 333 Foundry Street, Southeastern Mass, as a constable in the city of Rockton for a term of three years. Invited Robert Bishop. Mr. Bishop, are you in attendance? Mm -hmm. If you could please come forward. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, a statement for the council tonight? Uh, I'm asking for reappointment uh, so that I can continue to make myself available for the city and the residents. Uh, I do maintain an office in the Brockton area, and I would like to be reappointed again if I may. Entertain a motion? Motion to recommend favorable. Second. Second. Motion was Thank made you. properly second. A favorable recommendation back to the full city council. If you're in favor of this, please raise your hand. If you're opposed, raise your hand. That motion carries. Thank you, sir. It's referred back favorably. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good Chairman. evening. Councilor. I make a motion to take items 8 and 9 out of order. Second. second. Motion was made uh, properly seconded. Take agenda items 8 and 9 out of order. All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed, raise your hand. Motion carries. Eight and nine. Madam Clerk, we're going to take out of order. Resolved that the representatives from the Brockton Blue Dog Shelter located at 1014 Pearl Street come before the Finance Committee to discuss the organization's purposes, goals, and benefits to the city of Brockton and its neighboring communities. <laughs> Invited Jenny Mather, founder of Brockton Blue Dog Shelter, and Militia Cronshaw um, from the Blue Brockton Blue Dog Shelter. Mr. Chair. Councilor Sullivan. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, members of the committee, I just wanted to let you know I filed this resolve. I've had the, uh, the honor and privilege to uh, support the Blue Dog Shelter for some years now, but I recently sat in on one of their meetings, and there's some passion there that I, that I haven't seen at a lot of meetings that I attend, and I do go to quite a few of them. So I thought it'd be appropriate um, to bring two of the representatives before us tonight to talk about the organization and to give us uh, really kind of a, uh, a, a snapshot of what they do, why they do it, and how it benefits not just the city of Brockton, but also neighboring communities. So with that, ladies, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for having us. Good evening. Thank you. Um, so my name is Jenny Mather, and I'm the founder and director of the Blue Dog Shelter. And um, many say that I do my full-time job. I just was stating this um, on Thursday, that because I have a passion of rescuing dogs, and so my full-time job, which is owning JM Pet Resort, which is a business that's here in the city, um, that I might add, actually just one small business of the year. Um, proudly, I'm proud to say that. Um, we, have, we founded this nonprofit that is run like a good business. And the reason why I say that is because this isn't just about what we can offer one dog, but it's also about what we can offer all of the people that come to us. Because it's really the people that are attached to those dogs, too, that we need to be concerned about. And so our business model as a shelter is much different than any other. We're looking to not just help dogs, but help people. And we know that. So what makes us successful and what makes us special? Well, we're unique. We're an animal shelter, but we're located within a training facility where there's a lot of success rate in rehabil rehabilitating these dogs and also knowing who's dangerous, who's not dangerous, what dogs should make it, unfortunately what dogs might not make it, but make real hard decisions that <coughs> shelters sometimes when they have the best intentions aren't equipped to make those quick witted needed decisions unless they have a professional on board that's a skilled dog handler. Now. When I say skilled dog handler, again, not to um, pat myself on my back for my business, we're talking about a facility that gets 140 dogs a day, okay? So we know dogs. So when we're working with the 20 dogs that are from Blue Dog, we get to know those dogs too. We want to place safe animals. 
we want to take in animals that are hard to place and that need places to go. And it's not just people who neglect dogs that need a place to go. Because divorces happen and people move into houses every day that can't accept animals and all of a sudden it's your friend that can't keep their dog. Or people get cancer and they can no longer care for their beloved animal but it's 12 years old and they want to know that, that dog has somewhere to go to live out its good life. And that's the niche that the Blue Dog Shelter holds. Not just to take the animal control dogs that we do from West Bridgewater the animal control dogs that we do from Brockton, which we, had, we took 18 in one year out of Brockton Animal Control. That was 18 dogs that we took off of the city's hands. And with help, we could do so much more. If you were to ask Tom DeCellis and his team how helpful we've been in some of the cases, for those of you that don't remember the Blue and Sadie case that was in the summer of 2012, it was the pit bulls that were found on Montello Street we stepped into that. The big guns wouldn't even step in. The MSPCA didn't step in. The Animal Rescue League didn't step in. But your local shelter, Brockton Proud, Brockton Blue Dog Shelter stepped in and, so to speak, saved the day. Because those dogs didn't need to be euthanized. They need to be re rehabilitated. And with a little bit of time and a little bit of effort, that's what happened. And what happened was the Brockton Animal Control didn't have to have the backlash of euthanizing two perfectly good dogs that didn't need to be euthanized. <clears throat> so we have a 92% success rate in all of our adoptions. And what that means is not that we bring them in and push them out. What it means is that our success rate in keeping dogs in their families is 92%. That's huge. The national average is 50. I'm going to say that again. The national average is 50% on returns on adoptions. When we put a dog into a forever home, we are 92% of the time on target. That 8% that we get a return dog or something like that is usually right away, and or it's a dog that someone has themselves fallen on financial hardship. We have programs to ensure this. It's been built here what started as a small dream for me has been built strategically, business piece by business piece, to become this well-built oil machine of a shelter, and you have it here in Brockton. Good evening, counselors. Thanks for having us. My name is Malisha Croncha. I am the development and communications liaison between JM and the Blue Dog Shelter. And I just want, I see some of you looking at the brochure, if you could just take the pleasure of looking on the very back part and you will actually see the dog that she is talking about who is the white and tan pit bull in the back and you can see a before and after photo. That before photo was actually when he was taken from the Montello Street location and if you can see he's very much emaciated and then the picture next to him is what he looks like now. And also, I would like to conclude that Blue is the mascot today of the Blue Dog Shelter. And he has been in the hands and in the arms of many children. He has been to schools. And this was a dog of four dogs that were left pretty much for dead on Montello Street that probably wouldn't have had a chance if it wasn't for the Brockton Blue Dog Shelter. So our main goal today is to let you know that we are here. We hope we're not going anywhere. And we just need your help to help these dogs. We also have this incredible Sakari's Kids education program that goes far and beyond any other shelter. And actually, Jenny personally and myself have been told by educational professionals that they have not heard or seen of such a program. And we put in front of you a PowerPoint that we actually had used in the West Bridgewater School Department for their D.A.R.E. program. And it was like an absolute hit. The very back of this program, there is a pledge that we ask the children to take, and it has a very strong anti-bullying message. And what we do is we use these dogs, because every child loves dogs, regardless of what their history or background is. Dogs bring out a very special compassion inside children, even children that people can't reach, Ch teachers can't reach, and parents can't reach, a dog will reach that child. Even it's been reported and studies have shown that a child that wouldn't talk, would talk when they spent time with the dog or read to a dog. 
So I really would like for you to really take some consideration in this educational program, if anything at all, and remember the Blue Dog Shelter and the goodness that we do. And yes, we do have a very strong hold on our behavior and training model um, that we do use from JM Pet Resort. No other shelter has that opportunity. No other shelter is housed in, su in such a great facility. So our dogs get two trainings a week. By the time that dog is put up for adoption, we know exactly that dog's behavior and what home it should go in. And also the Sakari Kid Program teaches children the most important thing of all, <clears throat> safety, dog safety. Dog bites, they're incredibly increasing. We have more and more people living in with one square area. You gotta include the dogs as well. More people, more dogs, you're gonna have more accidents. So that also teaches that. One of, one of the other things that is real important about the shelter and the relationship between that and JM Pet Resort is that we're socializing dogs here. We're socializing them with other dogs, with lots of people, in lots of different situations. We're making sure that they're safe in different situations. We're not just taking it to chance to having a dog that's been in a cage, that's been temperament tested, that all of a sudden um, comes out and for its first initial week, now it's learning how to be in society. We're teaching them how to be in society because that's what we teach all day at the resort. So that's very important in the fact that we have this 92% success rate. I started this off by saying that I ran it like a business. Well, if you give me a dollar, okay, and I have, and I take that dollar and I put it into the shelter, and then all of a sudden it goes towards Suzy Q, but Suzy Q gets returned. Well, then your dollar was wasted. And it takes a lot more than a dollar to start to hold these dogs for a little while while they're waiting for homes. So that's a lot of money that's being flushed down the toilet when you have people that are donating to causes where the dogs are being returned. When you have a 92% success rate, that's all of a sudden a donation that you can make and you can have pride and you can think, hey, geez, I know that they have a good track record. They have a good success rate. They are not just turning over dogs. They're turning over dogs and they're staying in their homes forever. And with this Sakari's Kids program, which has been a dream for 10 years, this allows these kids to learn empathy and to come in and learn about dogs and learn about compassion, um, exercise, shelter, uh, safety like Malisha talked about, body language, it's just, it's a golden opportunity. But we need, he we need help, that's what we need, we need help. Mr. Chair, we need I visibility, and um, we'd love to take questions. Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to thank uh, Ms. Mather and, and Ms. Cronshaw for being here. Um, I think really the intent of the resolve, first of all, was to have a forum where they could educate because you hear about the Blue Dog Shelter, but it's here and you can see what the benefits are. It's, it's real benefits. I mean, when you're talking about 92%, I mean, that's, that's a hard number. That's a statistic. So um, I want to thank you. I mean, you, you didn't have to be here tonight and, and I'm glad that you did because I think it was worthwhile. And with that, Mr. Chair, I don't know if any of my colleagues have questions, but I want to thank both of you and I want to thank what you're doing for Brockton and surrounding neighborhoods. Thank you. Council. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Yes, hi. Uh, thank you. Thank you, ladies, so much. I'm very familiar with uh, what you do and have recently uh, become more engaged with the two of you and, and your mission. Um, I just wanted to say uh, Saturday you had an event, uh, a rabies clinic and some demonstration. They had a uh, uh, Coda was there, the police dog, doing a demonstration. Some husky, Boston husky pulling dogs were there also doing a demonstration. And um, just the, the amount of care and compassion that you all had for the dogs, the visiting dogs, as well as the ones that were there um, in your demonstration for the training. I, I'd, I'd never seen something like that. And that's something that you can't teach. That's innate. And when someone, and I'm a, a dog lover myself. I have two, well, I brought them, two naughty, naughty dogs. Um, <laughs> When, when someone can uh, connect with an animal like that and know what they're thinking and know how to behave with them and know how to communicate with them, it's something very special. And I um, you know, will definitely communicate further on the plans that I have for the city with regard to um, pet friendly, uh, uh, pet friendly situation and, and I just want to make sure that everyone takes advantage of, of what you have there and, and you know, if anyone is looking to adopt a dog, um, your, your facility is the place to do it because like you said, you, you research the psychology of the dog, how to place them in a forever home, like you said, and, and that's, that's the point. So just blending, making families with, with animals, and I, I applaud you in anything that I can do 
to uh, to help you. Please, please call me. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Moynihan. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Council. Council. Council Moynihan. Thank you. <coughs> naughty dogs. Is that oh, they're so naughty. <laughs> <laughs> we won't go into that now. <laughs> I just want to say that they do a great job there. My wife uh, just recently took a puppy down there for the first class. She was quite impressed, and uh, they're going to actually move on. We've had, and she's been trying to use some of the, these things she's learned at home, but I told her I'm not staying for a dog treat. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> well, just, just wait till we, what we have in store next. <laughs> I think she's thinking about boarding me down there, but that might be the next. But we had them board there, and they put the chips in on the dogs there, so we've used them. We just, we just had that nice comedy night. That was a blast. We went to that. It was, oh, we raised good. a lot of money. So, But you do a great job. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you, uh, Thank you Councilor. Councilor, for your uh, wisdom tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Stewart. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairperson. Uh, you guys are fantastic, and I'm happy that you're here and really just appreciate what you do for the city. And I've seen you guys in operation. It's been, I think, my first introduction to you is over, it feels like six years ago, if not. Quite a while ago. Yeah. It was at the old facility. And um, not only was it at the old facility, but it was during the, the formative years. It was during the formative years, so. It was quite a long time ago. Yeah, I mean, we've worked out a lot of kinks. Yeah, I think it's we've great. had a long time. Yeah. And, Thank um, you. Just, no, just proud of the work that you do. And what's also fantastic is I've learned through Ms. Ms. Cronshaw that you guys also get kids involved in the whole process, including uh, the work of helping to support the shelter, which I think is very important. So just I, I um, think you run an incredible business. You provide a important service and we thank you and I'm hoping that this forum helps uh, with the public watching on TV to get the word out and um, just more success to you so thank okay, you. Okay that's great. Thank, thank you Councillor. Mr. Thank Chairman you, I'm gonna make a favorable recommendation back Second. to the full City Council. Second. Second. Made and seconded to send this back to the full City Council with favorable recommendation. All in favor? Opposed goes back to the full City Council. Thank you. And thank, thank you for bringing this thank to you. our attention. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> Madam uh, Clerk we're number nine. Resolved that Mr. Justin Smith come before the Finance Committee to discuss his desire, dedication, and determination to change the law of the Commonwealth and require that any assault and battery on a police officer responding to a criminal activity shall be prosecuted as a felony rather than the current misdemeanor charge. Invited Justin Smith. Mr. Chair. Councilor Sullivan. I follow this resolve. I've, I've, uh, just for clarification purposes, uh, Mr. Smith is the, is the proud son of a, a, a veteran dec decorated police officer. Jimmy Smith here in the city of Brockton. Uh, but Justin um, has been going around the Commonwealth uh, with a crusade, and it's, it's really a, a valid effort that he's doing. Uh, and I've met with him, and I know he's working with one of our state reps uh, that serves the city of Brockton, Mike Brady, and there's a pending uh, house bill right now. It's kind of languishing up there, but I thought it'd be appropriate to have Justin come before us. I know on the local level, we don't really have a lot of teeth. Uh, it has to change at the, uh, the legislature uh, up at Beacon Hill. But I, I, I just want to applaud Justin as a Brockton resident. Uh, I mean, he, he's met with many, many police chiefs, and he can tell us about that. Um, but he really is, is someone that uh, has a, a real purpose and a sense of being on, on getting this law passed, because right now it makes no sense to have it uh, as a misdemeanor. It's ludicrous. And uh, I just thought it would be appropriate to have him come before us tonight and explain his pursuits and his purpose and his efforts. And with that, Justin, thank you for being here. Thank you, Council. Mr. Smith, good evening. <laughs> Thank you for Take your time. Thank you for a a a allowing me to this is this is to this is to stand be before you <clears throat> I have been since I have uh, learned about this bill okay the this is the house bill is 37 37 46 right now it is it is pending this is public hearing this is an act, this is an act relative 
to a a a a assault on a police officer re, re, responding to criminal act, activity. I have met with over 400 police departments throughout the Commonwealth. I have spent many hours either re responding to various emails. This is meeting with police chiefs, police op, op this is this is officers because this bill needs to be changed. Massachusetts is one of the only states in the country that has not modified this bill. Every day, police officers throughout the throughout the Commonwealth they do get assaulted while re responding to to a call. I have, being that my dad is a, he is a, a Brockton po, po police officer, I have, I have listened to, this is the fuss, this is the frustrations that 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 criminals do a a assault this is po police officers including him himself many times this is the criminal spends very little time into jail. Sometimes, sometimes nothing at all. Okay, police officers are out every single day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, protecting and also serving every every co community throughout the Commonwealth. Every police officer should be able to go home s s safely. Whether or not they, they, they get a, a assaulted while, per, per, while performing their duties, I cannot emphasize the importance of this bill. I ask that we need to we need to make a stand. Okay, criminals right now know if you come to Massachusetts and if you assault, this is a police officer, you will have, there will be very little punishment. That needs to change. Being that I am a son of a, of a police officer, I have hit the ground and I have ran with this. I cannot, I cannot say I have met with I have met with so many people on every single level. I have met with this this is with deputy sheriffs. I have met with this is with district A A attorneys. I have met with 
I have also met with MBTA cops. I have met with police officers from, this is, this is from Brockton to Boston, this is to Quincy, to Lawrence, even down the Cape. I get asked, okay, okay, why? I do it because we need, <coughs> now I, I do this because of It, 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 it needs to be done, okay? Too many police officers every day, they do get assaulted. It has become more prevalent into, into today's society that a, that a po police officer gets assaulted. I know that that is not going to change, but we need to change the punishment, okay? Currently, it is a misdemeanor, okay? Okay, by that, they, they will be punished from 90 days up to two and a half years into House of, house of Corrections. Okay, with this bill being changed, okay, it will be no more than 10 years, okay, 10 years. We need to make the change. I, my phone, my e e email, always going. Every Every police officer that, that I have spoken to says to me, thank you. You don't have to do this. But I, I didn't get asked to do this. I volunteered to do this. Okay? I've, I have spoken to, this is, this is to, this is to President Sullivan. This is on many different, uh, occasions about this and this is something that that I know that this is something that I know that is not going to change overnight but I believe we should you know stand and lead every single police department throughout the Commonwealth and say enough is enough, okay? I ask you, this is to support this bill. Now, now, now currently I have been working with, this is with Michael Brady, okay? I do speak to him on a daily basis about this bill. And, 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 and right now, currently, this bill is, it is, it is waiting. This is a public hearing, okay? This bill has gone up three times and it has been shut down because of no support. Okay, no support at all. I, I have, I have lived, breathed, and I have slept on this bill since October. There has not been a day that that I have not met with police officers, one way or the other. Most, most police officers and, and also most police departments are in favor of this bill. I know this isn't going to happen overnight, okay. but 
I, I believe if we as a city, okay, stand behind every police officer and say, you know what, you go out, you, you are doing your duties, protecting and, and serving, we do support you. And every, every single criminal who does a salt a who who does a salt a po po police officer should be held liable for their punishment at times there have been po po police officers that have also succumbed to th this is to their injuries due to being assaulted. I know it's not going to change, but we need to make a stand. I will do whether this you know, passes this year, next year, I will keep on doing it. Okay? I do believe okay, that every police officer Throughout, throughout the Commonwealth deserves every reason to go home safely at night. And every single criminal n needs the wake-up call, okay? Massachusetts, we need to say enough is enough. I ask all of you to please support this bill. We will. Thank you. Mr. Well, chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Smith. Thank you for your presentation. Mr. Smith, I want to uh, uh, I, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Smith, I want to thank you. I mean, I've met with you countless times, and uh, I've made a lot of calls to different police chiefs that I know around Massachusetts, and they've right. met with you, and, right. and they've called me back and given me very positive feedback. I mean, you're very passionate and dedicated, and, and you're not going away, and you will get this done. And I think from the local level, my thought was, first of all, to have you come before us and educate us here. Uh, because when a police officer responds uh, to a situation, um, they should have uh, really the expectation to be safe and not be assaulted. And if they are assaulted, that person should be held accountable to, to, to the fullest extent of the law. Same with fire and EMTs and the, right. and the like. I mean, this is public safety uh, people. So I, I want to thank you for what you're doing. I think from the local level, we, we might be able to reach out to the state. I know I will. I can't speak for all my colleagues, but I suspect that they will. And again, I really wanted to have you here tonight, and, and I want to thank you uh, and keep up the fight because you're fighting the good fight, Justin. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. Also, Studinsky. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. You're welcome. Justin, I want to thank you so much for being here. Yes. Uh, you're working hard. We appreciate it. With that, I would make a motion that this be sent back to the full council with a favorable recommendation. Second, second. On the motion. On the motion. Uh, uh, that's, and, and once it's voted on next week, I will let the clerk know that I'd like to have our vote transmitted into the State House on bill number, House Bill number 3746 that we support it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. On the motion. That was actually my question. What was the House number? Uh, 303746. I, I do have a copy of, of the, the bill. Okay, so I can, um, and, and it's, and it is very laid out, um, but like like I said, okay, this bill has gone up before the house three times, and it has been shut down because of no support. Okay, and in in I do believe by. Having city council, okay, you basically support this bill. This will wake up every single lawmaker and say enough is enough. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Thank you. On the motion, Council Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Chair. I, I want to just echo the sentiments of uh, a former police chief and our esteemed colleague, uh, Paul Stadansky. I, I, I really thought the purpose was we need to, to send this into Beacon Hill. So I, I, I want to thank uh, Councilor Stadansky. I also, Justin, want to 
Thank you, Dad. I believe he and Peter Spillane are both going to be awarded uh, some distinguished awards pretty soon in Boston for yes, some they, early services. Yes, they are. Um, uh, they are. This is also Wednesday morning. Okay. Um, they they have both gone gone above and beyond. Um, you know, basically doing doing their job. Okay. I mean, in it is, you know, we we don't, you know, we we, you know, people take it for this is this is this is for granted, but at the end of the day, okay, they are human. They do have families, but I do believe every police officer throughout the throughout the Commonwealth has one common one common desire and that is to take the criminal element off of the street make our streets this is to be safe very good thank, thank you, you. Mr. thank, thank you, you counselor motion's been made and seconded to send it back to the full city council all in favor opposed goes back to the full city council with a favorable recommendation and Thank you, Mr. Smith. Thank, Thank you for your presentation. Madam Clerk, we go back to uh, item number two. Order transfer of $55,000 from the Planning Department Personal Services other than overtime to the Building Department Capital. The intended use of this money is to purchase a portable generator that would be large enough to run a building such as City Hall, the Library, or the Council on Aging in case of an emergency. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, James Cassiri, Superintendent of Public Property. Mr. Cassiri, good evening. Hello, Councilors. Uh, first, I just want to say, Justin, that was quite a presentation, and I can't believe a bill like that hasn't gotten passed. But I know. Anyway, uh, I'm here tonight to ask for this transfer for something that is long overdue. It's to buy a generator. I've always wanted to do one at City Hall. Council on Aging and the War Memorial, and one of my very astute uh, co-workers came up with the idea of a portable generator, and it was great because now I think if with this amount of money I can ensure that all three buildings, if we have a loss of power, especially like during the winter, we'll have this portable generator stored at my public property shop, and each building of those three will be ready to accept it. So we just pull the generator up, plug it into the building, and boom, we have power again. So. I'm asking for your support on this. Move for a favorable recommendation. Second. Motion made properly. Second, a favorable recommendation. Back to the full city council. All in favor, raise your hand. I got a question. On the, on the, on the on motion. motion. Council Rodriguez. Mr. Caseri. Yep. How are you, Councilor? Not bad. Uh, you're buying one generator? One generator. Portable generator. It's, it's a 200 amp generator, and it's situated on a trailer. It gets exercised once a month by my staff to make sure it's ready to roll. And if one of those buildings is down, we can simply hook it up to our truck, pull it up, and plug it in. Now, let me ask you a question. What happens when two buildings are down? Well, if there were two, if like w what we would do right now, if a building went down, I'd have to call a company up and they'd come in with their generator and we'd have to pay them. It would be an emergency procurement procedure and, you know, it would be rather expensive. And the cost of this generator is $55,000 for the and portal? And we'll do all three buildings. Yeah. We had a situation at the council last year where we had a power outage, so I had to send my crews over there with portable heaters, and they had to go work around the clock keeping the heat in the building until the power came back on. When you say it will do all three buildings, are you saying that it has the ability to hook up into these buildings? Correct. Not necessarily three separate We'll only buildings. do one. Correct. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, no, more, no, no further questions, Mr. Thank Mr. You. Chairman. Motion was made properly second. I, I actually, I'm sorry. Motion, Thank you, sorry. Uh, following up on actually something you said earlier, you said that you, for years you've wanted to get a generator to, to do this. Right, well, to get a generator here at City Hall, this is an historic building, mm -hmm. and to put a generator outside the building is almost impossible because you can't change the look of the outside of the building. And it would be an expensive endeavor. It would be probably five times what this is gonna cost us to have that situation resolved. Okay, so this won't be built into no, this the is new plan? Excuse me? It won't be built into the new plan? No, no. Okay. No. Okay. And, um, well, it would be portable, but um, if it's big enough to 
I guess, provide power in case of a, uh, a blackout or something to these three pretty decent sized buildings, how would it get around? Is there like a vehicle that would be specially for this or could it just kind oh, of- Oh, I have a vehicle that can tow this. <laughs> okay, great, thank, thank you, you. Any other questions, council on the motion? No, motion's made properly second favorable recommendation back to the council. Raise your hand if you're in favor. <coughs> Raise your hands if you're opposed, motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Casino. Thank you. Madam Clerk, number three, please. Order appropriation $417,000 from the stabilization fund to the police department personal services other than overtime. 401000 and from the Stabilization Fund to the Police Department Personal Service over time, 16000 in order to finance the proposed cost of the contract settlement with the Brockton Police Supervisors Union covering fiscal year 14, 15, and 16. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Conan, Chief Financial Officer, mm -hmm. Philip Nesrella, <coughs> City Solicitor, Marion Cruz, Personnel Director, Robert Hayden, Interim Police Chief, Lieutenant Donald Mills, President, Police Supervisors Union. Good evening. Good evening, Council. So I can speak about the financial aspects of this, of this order. Basically, what this request would do is to provide funding for a contract for the superior officers, which would, in, a, in essence, parallel the contract that was just approved for the Patrolman's Association. Uh, the difference is that the Patrolman's Association contract went back for a longer period because the superior officers settled uh, last year for the period that uh, this, this just ending. The way this differs is it provides a signing bonus to compensate for the fact that there wasn't any retroactive pay for the 11 and 12 period, and it provides a higher percentage increase in the first year uh, because that would have uh, compensated for the fact that there would have been a pyramiding of increases in the earlier. Other than that, it's about the same as the other contract. Uh, Councilor Ianeri. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Condon, with the, um, the appropriation of this money coming out of the stabilization fund, um, where do we see ourselves sitting now after having the last contract before us and even this one here now? What, what is left in stabilization? That'll bring it to about a little over $2 million as the balance in that, in that fund. Okay. And, and this also takes care of what I would probably adequately say some of our larger contracts. Am I correct? I mean, yes. at, at this point, you have settled in the city uh, for the next two fiscal years plus the year we're in. Every, every contract for the public safety unions uh, and, and what's remaining to be accomplished would be the librarians, the clerks, the laborers, and you know, the 1162 folks, but the largest unions are settled. Okay, um, and, and just comment um, on this particular contract, uh, no different than what I said just a few weeks ago when we had the uh, uh, Police Patrolmen's Association before us, their contract before us, as well as with the fire uh, department. I, I think that the one thing that, that we need to have in the city of Brockton is public safety and these people shouldn't be treated any differently, I, I wouldn't think. I, I know some people making different comments that you know we're, we're giving pay raises, but then again, I'm giving pay raises to keep public safety and keep the city safe is the way I'm looking at it. I don't care which way it's handled, you know what I'm saying? So, I agree. Um, and, and that being said, I mean, I am not opposed to what's before me this evening, and, and I appreciate all the work that you did as well as the negotiation uh, uh, members with you and, and, and the team as well. Um, you know, on the supervisors uh, union side and, and appreciate the fact that we're able to, to get this wrapped up and, and, and move forward. I realize it's costly and, and we're going to have to deal with it as we move into the next future years. But as I said a few weeks ago, it's not like we haven't been that route before. Yes. Um, and we'll figure it all out. But in any case, uh, I appreciate all the work that's been done uh, by both sides. So with that being said, I support it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Council, Council Bonds. Uh, yes, uh, actually, I think this might go to uh, Lieutenant Mills. Good evening, Lieutenant. Um, just some things. In section number 12, in overtime and the four-hour four hour minimum, uh, something that struck me, it just said something about, moreover, no officer who is out on no pay status. Could you tell us, are there currently any officers out on no pay status? In our association, I believe we have one. He um, has filed for accidental disability. Okay. And the... Retirement Board, PEREC, the uh, Public Employees Retirement Commission, has denied him. He is appealing that on his own through PEREC, um, but he is not eligible to work. He feels he's not fit for duty. He's seen another doctor that says he's not fit for duty. Mm -hmm. uh, he is on an OPE status, but he's not an employee who would be looking to come to work an overtime assignment anyway. Um, we generally don't have an issue with people on a no-pay status. Every once in a great while, it does arise. Right. This is an incident where if we had somebody on a no-pay status, they wouldn't be eligible to be no-pay 
and then come in for a shift other than their right. own and work at time and a half. Okay, that was my clarification. And uh, one other thing. On 17, the mandatory uh, wear policy, it mentioned about um, the body armor and you know, some of the additional pieces <coughs> that are needed with some of the, uh, the, the strategic units. Do we already have these things in place? Because I mean, I know the, like, the vest and everything that the officers have, but some of these additional things, do we have these or are they things that, they, that we would need to purchase? No, those are actually, that's, <coughs> I'll try to make it short. I, I, I don't want to be long winded. Okay. In a nutshell, everybody's been issued body armor. Every five years we get issued body armor. Okay. Uh, what's great is the, there's a federal grant that will give police departments the money, and we've been doing this for about the, approximately the past 20 years. Before that, officers were buying them on their own. But for approximately the past 20 years, the feds have issued the city a grant to allow them to pay for, so no cost to the city for officers to have uh, body armor. However, this past year, the feds have changed their grant to say, if you want to have this grant, you have to have a policy that has a mandatory wear. Therefore, we're adopting it into our contract so that the city, doesn't have to foot the cost, the Great. feds will continue to do so. Great, thank you, Senator, I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Council, Council Stewart. Thank you, uh, question for Mr. Condon, actually. Thank you. So, so, so with the unions that are remaining, uh, and if they were to have a similar type of contract, though I know it's atypical for that to happen because they're not, one of, they're not the larger unions that remain, but if that were the case, what would the cost of that be, looking at the fact that we have a little over uh, $2 million in reserves? Uh, well, I'm not certain that we would try to fund it out of the stabilization fund, Counselor. Uh, we'd, I'd be looking at this point to maintain the balance in that fund and try to fund it out of regular revenues. But the cost, if it were this kind of contract, would be across all of the remaining unions about a million. About a million. So. Uh, then I had a question uh, concerning detail work for officers, and, I just, and it's somewhat germane to this, but a bit of a sidebar. So when an officer is doing a private detail for a company and they're getting paid from that company and not from public resources, but that officer is using public resources, their car, uniform, weapon, and all that sort of stuff, what, I'm not sure, so what happens in a case like that? Are, is the city compensated for the fact that an officer is getting paid but they're also using public resources for that position? The city gets paid as well on those details. I think it's 10% on, on the detail rate, comes back to the city, and the officers in a, uh, uh, as a sworn officer is capable of responding to any police situation which re would require response while he's, uh, while he's out on the street. Okay, thank you. Detail. Okay, thank you very much. Thank <clears> you, <throat> Mr. Counsel, any other questions, counsels? I'd like to take a motion. Motion to recommend motion favor. favor. Second. 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 Motion made, properly second. A favorable recommendation, recommendation back to the full city council. All favor, raise your hands. All opposed, motion carries. Thank, Thank you, Council. Uh, Madam Clerk, number four, please. Resolved, the mayor be invited to appear before the May 19, 2014 Finance Committee to discuss his plan to appoint a full-time department head for the police department, chief or commissioner in accordance with the Mass General Law Chapter 41, Section 61A. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Mr. President, Councilors. Mr. Chairman. Resolve. This your resolve, Council? Yes, I filed this just to get a sense. I'm getting phone calls from my constituents about this, so I'm just wondering what your plan is, Mr. Mayor. Well, I think I've been, uh, Councilor, pretty consistent all along saying that, uh, that this is the plan. I have not made a final determination on a timeline or who it is. Uh, but I think that I have repeatedly made a commitment to the council that uh, when I do make that determination, I will send it up to the council for confirmation. What it is is, you said I've, I've just, if you wouldn't mind just explaining what your plan is once more, because you said uh, right, I've, I've said planned out what all it along, is. The long-term plan will be to appoint a, uh, a permanent police chief, uh, as we've described before, a uh, permanent uniform sworn officer under the age of 65. The exact timeline as to when I will do that and who that person will be is yet to be determined. But when I make that determination, I will send it up to the council for confirmation. Because right now the city of over 100,000 people has a half-time um, police chief who is appointed under a temporary status and who... Um, can't work more than 960 hours a year, which 
um, you know, divides out, which he would never do, to 18 hours a week. So I'm just trying to get my head around the fact, do you not think that there's a police officer or a captain or a lieutenant on the force that's qualified to do this full-time job? No, I don't think I've ever said that. I'm just um, asking you that question. First, uh, I think when you do the math for this year, it does divide out slightly higher because it's based upon a calendar year, and Chief Hayden was appointed on January 31st. So it would be divided by 11 months this year. And it's a flexible 960 hours. It doesn't have to be any specific hours um, per week. Uh, I don't, uh, I'm, I'm very satisfied with the great job that Chief Hayden is doing right now. And uh, I think the results uh, that have uh, occurred here in the city between January 31st and today um, has been impressive. And uh, I believe that uh, among many roles that he's fulfilling right now uh, is he is evaluating personnel at the Brockton Police Department that he's working with so that uh, when the time is appropriate, he'll be in a position to make recommendations to me to help in that selection process. Um, but uh, I think that the, um, all of the arrest statistics are up for the same period from a year ago. Uh, I think that uh, I get overwhelming support for him publicly, and I think we've said all along that he was a temporary, not a permanent appointment, and that is the intention. Do you, um, do you think that there, do you not think there is a, a police lieutenant or a captain that's qualified to be the full-time police chief? That's just my question. I'm sure we have several that are qualified. I think at this point in time today, I stand beside and behind Chief Hayden. I think he's doing a great job, and I think that he is the best person in the world to lead the Brockton Police Department today on an interim basis. Sure. Um, I am just befuddled that I, maybe it's because I grew up here and I've lived here my whole life and I have roots, deep, deep roots here in the community and I assume that at least five more generations will live here as there have been five that have lived here in the past, that I am surprised that a city of our size would ever have a part-time police chief. It, it, regardless of who the person is, um, it offends me deeply that there would be a part-time person at the head of our police department. Um, and especially since there is no deputy police chief in our city ordinances. There is, the chain of command seems broken to me because if this were the Coast Guard or the, um, the Marines, God forbid we put a part-time head of that department. And this is, a, this, is a, this is a military type of operation here. And I just, I personally, I just want you to know, and I want to do this publicly because I want the residents at home to understand that I speak for the residents of, that, represent, that I represent in Ward 6, and I think many other people in the city of Brockton, when we say that we want a full-time police chief, period. Um, so I understand that Mr. Hayden and Chief Hayden is an excellent human being. Um, you and I had an agreement that would have allowed um, Chief Hayden to be Commissioner Hayden and work in his part-time capacity as he's now doing as chief and move a chief up from the ranks and it would only cost $5,000 more to the city. And um, my fellow counselors tabled that, which Not I don't agree with. Not all of us, Well, the, the majority vote tabled that. And um, please excuse me, um, President, I, I apologize for that, but the majority vote tabled that item. And I just want to know, um, because right now, when I read uh, the section through by which you have appointed a temporary police chief, it's short, so I'm just going to read it really quick. Don't if, you have that addressed in another resolve that's coming up in a minute? Oh, I do, but this is also addressed here. Um, okay. Chapter 4161A. What I have before me, um, I think you heard the resolve. So it was asking you to appear to talk about your plans to appoint a full-time department head for the police department in accordance with Chapter 4161A. So I'm just asking for your input on this. So um, it says if there's an office of city 
auditor, city treasurer, city collector of taxes, or other officer having charge of a city department is vacant. So I assume that's why you're saying other officer in charge of a city department. Um, or any such officer, because of disability or absence, is unable to perform his duty, the mayor, without confirmation by the city council, any provision of the city charter or the contrary notwithstanding, shall appoint a temporary officer to hold office and exercise the powers and perform the duties thereof until another is duly elected or appointed and has qualified according to law or the officer who is disabled or incapacitated resumes his duties. And this is the portion I am interested in. But no such temporary officer shall be appointed under the section for a period longer than 60 days. Any such temporary officer shall be sworn and given bond for their faithful performance of his duties in accordance with the provisions of law applying to the officer whose place he fills, and it goes on. So. What I'm, what I'm wondering is I just, wanna, I just wanna get a straight answer. You think it's acceptable that the police department is being headed by a part-time police chief? The can answer I, can is I respond now? Okay. Sure. Um, so you, you've raised a number of things over there, so let me But I've asked you one question. Well, you've asked more than I've one. I've asked you one question. My question is, do you believe that it's okay to have a part-time police chief lead our police department? Obviously, I am very comfortable with the current arrangement. Uh, the reason I'm very comfortable with it is that if you take the period of time that Chief Hayden has been chief so far this year, January 31st to May 18th, I asked the police department to compile the arrest statistics for me. When you compare this period of time this year to the exact same period of time last year, total arrests are up 25% over the, the same period last year. 1,118 this year versus 896 last year. Could you send that along to us? Absolutely. Total felony arrests are up 47% over the same time Could period last numbers? year. 378 versus 258 last year. How about murders? How many more murders have murders we had Murders are probably date running right at now? about the same pace as I don't last know. year. Yeah. Because there were nine last year, and we're already nine. at six right Correct. now. Correct. You're absolutely we're not even right. Halfway through the year. But I, I, I'll stand by the job that's being done by the fine men and women of the Brockton Police Department. And your statement is incorrect about uh, that the chain of command has been broken or is different. We have the exact same chain of command that we always have had. I don't believe that. And to I be think true. that Chief Hayden has shown uh, that he's doing a great job. And as I said, when. Uh, when I make a determination as to when and who uh, I'll appoint as a permanent chief, the city council will be the first to know. Great. See, for me, it's not about um, Mr. Hayden. It's about your judgment in thinking that it's okay to appoint anybody who's a part-time police chief. I mean, if we had a part-time fire chief, would that be okay? Would it be okay to be a, have a part-time mayor? It's just, what for me, it belittles the importance of the position that you so easily are able to say, I'm gonna appoint not only a part-time police chief, that part-time police chief is gonna be on a temporary emergency appointment through, an, through a mass general law that really is just for temporary positions that I think that you're misusing and that you feel as though it's something to be proud of that you are putting a part-time person in charge of our Brockton Police Department. Now, I'm very I, proud of Chief Hayden and the job uh, that he's doing. It's not about the person. I think it's about your judgment and I don't agree with it. I would like it if you would appoint a full-time police chief to lead that department. It's an essential thing that every city needs. Maybe you could lobby my fellow counselors to have them take off the, what, what was put on the table so we could have a full-time police chief. And I will continue working on getting a full-time police chief. But for me, I just want you to understand where I'm coming from. I respect Mr. Hayden, and I respect his service to this country. I respect his service to Brockton. But I also respect the men and women that put on the bulletproof vest that we just approved funding for and go out and serve the city, and I think they deserve a full-time police chief. And I'm slightly offended when I hear um, talk, not from you, but from other people that belittles the police department and says that the reason that you've appointed Mr. Hayden is because the police department needs to be cleaned up and somehow infers that the officers that are working and putting their lives on the line are somehow corrupt or not doing what is appropriate. Because if that line of argument is too true, what you're doing by having a part-time police chief is just turning the keys over 
to whatever corruption that is there. I don't believe that there's corruption there, but I'm just making a whole. I'm going to stay on point, Counselor. Thank we're not you. Talking about corruption in, on this result. No, we're not. But what I'm saying is there. There's a part-time police chief. I think that we need a full-time police chief. And the fact that you're putting in a part-time police chief as a way to clean house or somehow prepare the department for some new transition, the person's part-time. What can a person do part-time? Can I just don't understand it. I don't agree with you. I hope that you will I think you made that clear, Counselor. And I will continue to do so because this is a public safety issue. It's a public safety issue that I will go to my de deathbed being proud that I, that Brockton somehow had the notion to put in a part-time police chief when no other community in this state has a part-time police chief. And the nerve that you think that you can just rewrite the law in your, in your own opinion based on no fact at all and no law that I've ever seen is astonishing to me. It's offensive. This has nothing personal for you or Mr. Hayden. It has to do with my values. And my values include having a full-time director of the police department. And the fact that we don't have that here in Brockton is a travesty and it's disgraceful. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, Councillor, I, I speak to those same men and women of the Brockton Police Department every day who put their lives on the line. And uh, I, I don't know which officers you're speaking to, but I speak to a large number of them on a regular basis, and they overwhelmingly support Chief Hayden, his leadership, and the job that he's doing. So I'm not sure who besides you shares your concerns, but it's not the men and women of the Brockton Police Department because I hear nothing but overwhelming support from the people who wear the uniform for the chief they're serving under. Mr. Chairman, I just have one more comment and then I'll, I'll turn it over if anyone else any, has any questions. Is, um, it, is it on relative it to is, the resolve? It is relative to this resolve. I have spoken with police officers that are concerned that the department is being run by a part-time police chief. It also has nothing to do with Mr. Hayden and their respect for him. And the fact that this is being twisted into one that it is about the person is also offensive to me because these people deserve to have a full-time police chief. It's not about any sense of loyalty. It's not about how good you feel at work. It comes down to the fact that in this state, Brockton, a city of 100,000 people with a high crime rate, is the only municipality that thinks we can run the show with a part-time police chief. It's unacceptable. It's disrespectful. It doesn't hit the benchmarks. It isn't what is called for, and it isn't what the taxpayers deserve. They pay a lot of money in taxes, and they deserve a full-time police officer. Thank you, Councilor. As a chief, thank you. Anybody else? Councilor Stewart. Mr. Chairperson, um, Mr. Mayor, can you repeat those statistics for me again, please? Sure. I will be happy to either email these out yeah. to the councilors in the morning. I just received these this afternoon. Uh, <clears throat> January 31st through May 18th, 2013 versus 2014. Total arrests are up 25% from 896 to 1,118. Total summons are up 7% from 897 to 958. The statistic that really jumps off the page at me is total felony arrests. These are the most serious arrests. 2013, 258. In 2014, 378 for the same time period. This clearly shows that these are important, significant arrests that are being made. The numbers are not being padded by small and sequential arrests. They're making a difference, almost a 50% increase. And total felony summons are up 16%, 266 last year to 308 this year. So I am, uh, I am extremely satisfied with the job that's being done, not just by the chief, but all the men and women of the Brockton Police Department. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. If you could also, in addition, I think I had requested you guys start to track the impact with some data, and I appreciate that. I, that was I, actually, that thought was the reason I requested this information. Oh, well, I appreciate it. I would like to also, if you could expand the sort of the trend, I'd like to if, have you guys go back several years so that I can just sort of assess if that bump in numbers is something that has historically happened yeah. anyway. If you can give us just a little time to put it together, yeah, we'll that. be happy to work on that for you. I'd like, also like to have information on if there are any trends that are going in the opposite direction where things are not improving. I just, I'd like to have a, a more full picture. I specifically requested arrest data and that's all of the arrest data. Okay. 
Um, but with that said, I would say I'm, I'm supportive of what you're doing uh, with uh, the, the interim appointments, appointments of the police chief. I, I mean, ideally, I think we all would like to have a full-time chief at the helm. I believe you feel the same way at the same there time. There will be one. There yeah. will be one. I also think, though, that uh, we can sometimes become consumed by seat time, which is how much time you spend in a position versus results. And I think what you're showing is that the results, which ultimately is what we want, regardless of how much time someone puts in, is that we want to see changes in an outcome. So um, I'm encouraged by the numbers that I'm seeing. And I, and I think if we can look at a bigger picture, I think that will um, make an even stronger case for the, the, this appointment being successful. Um, is, so it just, I just want to have a sense of the commissioner's hours. Um, so he's in Brockton every day, I mean, at least five days a week, he, or is he He's, he's managing his own hours. I mean, the 960 hours over 11 months is flexible. Uh, he has the ability to not be in the city, but if an event occurs, he's called and can be here shortly. Uh, I think that he has the best judgment and discretion to, de to decide when his time is best used. I think he also has a lot of confidence in uh, some of the officers, uh, supervising officers that are serving directly under him. And I think he feels as though he's able to pass along instructions that will be uh, carried out and implemented by the supervising officers under his direction. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, he's doing it very effectively. I think that the officers in the department have great confidence in him. And I think that this is an interim appointment and I've never said anything from the beginning, other than the fact that this was going to be a uh, short-term assignment, and and that's the the plan has never changed. Great. Uh, so two other comments and then a question. Uh, so I've only have heard positive feedback from uh, officers uh, on the street, I guess, and I interact with a, a number of officers uh, when I go out and do my public service, and I've heard from these officers for a number of years, and I've never ever heard such enthusiasm for the work that's being done at the police department. And that's clearly anecdotal and qualitative, but over my, I mean, my third term, and I've just, the overwhelming sense that I've gotten from police officers is that they are excited to be working for this police chief and excited about doing their job. So I haven't heard a single complaint, literally not a single complaint from a single police officer who's, who's interacted with me. Um, and anecdotally, I hear the same things, and obviously not uh, scientific, uh, but when you hear it 100 times from a 150 officer force, I think it uh, becomes pretty clear. Uh, so what exactly is the chain of command? The chain of command is you've got the, uh, you've got the chief of police, you've got captains directly under him, and the, the chief also has a chief of operations who does not oversee the captains, reports directly to the chief, but is there as the, uh, as the, in essence, executive officer or chief of operations to the chief. In the past, several chiefs have all had the exact same type of setup. Mm -hmm. uh, and my last comment is that, uh, I, and it's not to impugn any group of people as a whole, but I have also uh, had circumstances and complaints come to me that there are some things that at the police department I think are worth improving. And so um, I'm supportive of this move because I think Mr. Hayden is all about making those improvements happen, and uh, I think they're important. So I, I wish uh, us all well in this endeavor. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you for no, support, Councilor. Let's stay on point. The resolve is to discuss, have the mayor come to discuss his plan to appoint a full-time department head of the police department. Let's stay on point. Councilor Rodriguez, followed by Councilor Bond. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Good, good evening, evening. Councilor. Uh, I guess um, my question is to somehow um, quarrel some of the concerns that the uh, residents of Brockton actually have in this particular matter. When we say um, part-time chief, it, it's almost implied that the, com the command structure is in place for four hours versus an eight hour. Could you just possibly go through the, I know you kind of mentioned it, you know, when you were answering the uh, council stewards question in terms of the, uh, in terms of the command structure. How right. is basically, I mean, you've got, a, you've got a police chief, even if he was full time, he would be spending, what, eight hours in the city versus the four hours versus the three hours, whatever the deal is. I, I think so chiefs how is have that, always made their own hours, Councilor. Yeah. But it's not like the, 
the police department is left unattended when the police chief is in, in town? No, I, I think that, um, and obviously I'm, I'm not a uh, law enforcement expert, uh, but my understanding of it is that the structure is the same. We have six captains who serve under a chief. They all have a variety of uh, responsibilities assigned to them from a command standpoint. They have lieutenants who serve under them, who have sergeants serving under them. It's, it's the same number of supervising officers and the same command structure. The chief is always, um, and Chief Stensky can help me with this, but I know under at least the last two, the last three chiefs that I can recall, maybe even a little longer, have also had an executive officer or chief of operations who's someone selected by the chief to also work alongside the chief. And in this case, uh, Lieutenant Crowley is, is that person. And um, I do believe that the chief delegates a lot of the day-to-day -day operations of the police department to his six captains and to Lieutenant Crowley as he sees fit. And they're all supported by a whole organization of uh, supervising officers under them as you go down the chain of command. So uh, I am very comfortable that Chief Hayden has been able to effectively manage the police department and delegate responsibility and oversee the entire operation. And I think at the same time, he's provided leadership and inspiration to the people who work in the department. Um, and I, I just believe he's doing an outstanding job. But we've said from day one, that this is designed to be an interim appointment. I do not plan for this to be long-term. Um, and at some point with Chief Hayden, uh, I will make a, a determination that it's time to uh, hand off the baton and appoint the next person. And when I do that, I have committed all along to bringing that uh, nomination forward to the City Council for confirmation. Just um, as a point of clarification, at least from my understanding, when the police chief clocks out, he does his four hours, five hours, whatever the deal is, who is in charge of the Brockton Police Department? It would be, we have some, it would be the, the ranking captain. I mean, I'm not a police officer here. You know? <laughs> no, I have a pretty good idea. I don't know which captains are there at which time, counselor. It would be the same as even for, the police department is operated 24 hours a day. So if the chief is there for five hours or eight hours or nine hours, the majority of the 24-hour shift of a day, the chief is not there, and there's a chain in command in place. So there are shift commanders in charge of each shift. There are captains that have specific responsibilities to oversee different facets of the operation. We have 20 sergeants, six captains, and how many lieutenants? 13. 13 lieutenants. So there's no shortage of management, supervising officers that all have duties and responsibilities very clearly laid out to them. So there's always somebody in charge, basically. There are always several people in charge with someone at the top, as always. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, no, no further questions. Thank you, Council. Council Bonds? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Mayor, just to be clear, um, your plan is to, after um, Chief Hayden's term is over, statutorily over, uh, to appoint someone full-time to be the de department head of the Brockton Police Department, correct? I've said all along, Council, that my intention for Chief Hayden was for him to serve no longer than one year. Right. No. Yeah. That's and what I said. So yeah. after he is statutorily done, your intention is to appoint someone, well, someone else. His appointment is for 60 days because that's what I'm allowed to do under the law. And we get to the next resolve, I'll allow the city solicitor to answer the legal questions uh, because I'm not an attorney. But... Okay, um, hold on. You're getting way complicated. My question is... Well, you're using the word statutorily, and I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that. That he's here for one year. But to serve 960 hours for one year. That's what I mean. I'm not trying to get... That's, that's my intention, but Can there's have, no um, statute that says that. Point okay. of information. No. Through the chair to um, uh, Councillor Barnes, um, Councillor at Large Barnes. That is the Mass General Law that the Chief is currently um, serving under, yeah. and it doesn't say anything about a year. There's no year involved. It's 60-day emergency temporary appointments. There's no, there's no year. I, I understand you. that, but I'm right. saying the contract with the city is for him to be here for a year. And in my communications with him, as he has also said from that podium, his plan is to be here for one year starting January 31st. So Mr. it will Chairman, be Chairman, point of information? Um, there is no contract that says one year. The contract says 60-day emergency appointment. Okay, right. a gentleman's handshake 
that says he'll be here a year. Okay, here's my question. Is it at all possible that um, with the, the uncertainty that I feel at this time that you're presenting, that there, that there may not be someone at this particular time, come, you know, we're, we're six months into this year, this calendar year almost, that there may not be someone who is ready to take uh, the June is six months, right? Well, Chief Hayden has been serving for three and a half months. Calendar year, calendar year. So at this particular point, I'm to understand you say that there is no one that, is, that you or anyone else uh, that you're confident can take over and be the department head of the Brockton no, Police. I, now, I didn't that, say that's that, what no. it sounds like. That's exact, that, I'm just trying to translate what I hear. In response to an earlier question, I said I believe there are a number of uh, members of the Brockton Police Department that are qualified to serve as a chief. But my choice is the best thing for the city of Brockton today is Chief Bob Hayden. And I've presented him from the very beginning with an intention to have him serve up to one year. Uh, but I am by law allowed to appoint him 60 days at a time on an interim basis. When we get into the questions the councilor has about the statute, I will allow the city solicitor to respond to those because there is outstanding litigation with the city. Actually, okay, if I could just kind of finish. Sure. Nothing that I have to say has anything to do with anything you all just said. I just okay. want to make sure I'm clear right. on that. I'll listen to the whole thing. At the end of his term, is it possible that you might find someone else like a Chief Hayden from a different area to come in to be again appointed for this next 60 days or the 60 days starting, you know, uh, February 1st or something when he's done or whenever his time is over? Is that, that's all I'm saying, is that possible? Because, and, and I, when I walked in late and you, I remember you saying, I think at the ordinance hearing, um, you're very clear that at that particular point there was no one in the Brockton Police Department that you felt comfortable that could lead the, the police department. I believe Councilor Stewart asked that right. question. And you said it then. So I, I, I've not heard anything from then to now that makes me feel confident what I, what that I there's said somebody it? that can do it. Hold on one second. My question is, will someone else from a Hingham or from a, a, a Lowell or you know some other you know Batman, you know, Joe, um, whatever from Lean On Me, will that person come in here as well? You're asking about the permanent appointment that I'll bring forward yeah. to the council? Yeah. When it's time to select a, a nominee to be the permanent chief of police, there'll be a thorough search both inside and outside of the department. Um, I, you know, if I had a preference, my preference probably would be to promote someone from within, mm -hmm. but I am committed to a full and thorough search of all candidates, whether they're inside or outside the Brockton Police Department. If I could clarify my statement that you questioned before, I believe what my response to that question at the time was, was that I did not believe there was anyone more qualified than Bob Hayden to serve at that time. No. Well, we'll have to go back and check what I said. Yeah, okay, so there is a possibility that someone outside of the Brockton Police, the current sworn officers of the Brockton Police Department could serve as our chief, uh, lead officer of the Brockton Police Department. I'm sure we have several folks within the Brockton Police Department that are capable of serving, but I've appointed Chief Hayden and supported Chief Hayden because I do not think we have an individual with his leadership, with his background, with his experience, who's in a position to do what he's doing for the Brockton Police Department. Okay, I, I really don't want to belabor this. I really don't. But the question, I'm trying to stick to the focus of what, what the right. resolve is here. Your plan going forward. I'm not talking about how you feel about him today. I feel the same way about him. He's excellent. However, going forward, is it possible that someone outside of the Brockton Police Department could be appointed or could be um, presented as the chief of the Brockton Police? It's possible, yes. But I do not plan to appoint anyone else on an interim basis other than Chief Hayden. When I'm ready, oh, okay. I'll make a permanent appointment. Oh, okay. I'm committed to a full-time permanent chief counselor, and at whatever point Chief Hayden and I decide that it's time for someone else to take the baton, I will appoint a permanent police chief, and I will bring that nominee in front of the city council for confirmation. Oh, great. So the city okay. council will have ample opportunity to vet that appointment. Excellent. All right. I'm just going to write that down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Council, you. Does anybody else?
Casa Dubois. Um, I just want to say, um, during your time at the podium, I heard you say, when the time comes, you'll appoint a full-time police chief, and you said, when I'm ready. I want you to know that- When I believe it's in the best interest of the city of Brockton and its residents. Look, if, I could, if I could just finish. I want you to know that I, I think the time is now, and I think one day, with a city of 100,000 people, with the crime rate that we have, with six people murdered in the last five months, the time is now to have a full-time police chief. And this idea of putting whoever as a part-time head of the police department is unwise, it's unreplicated anywhere else in the state, and it's disrespectful to the taxpayers of the city and to the police officers that are putting their life on the line. Thank I you, pray that you will reconsider, please. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. Motion was made properly second. A favorable recommendation back to the full city council. If you're in favor, raise your hand. Reports, raise your hand. Motion carries. Favorable recommendation back to the full city council. Madam Clerk, okay. number five, please. Resolved. Oh, <clears throat> before that, I do have a letter here. I'm sorry, I forgot to uh, read it. Mike Thorson, Commissioner, uh, please be advised that I, Mike Thorson, Michael Thorson, am uh, unavailable to attend the above reference meeting scheduled to be held on May 19th at 7 o'clock in the council chamber due to a conflict with my schedule. I have a prior commitment on the same date and time for which I am unable to change or postpone. If you have any questions, do not hesitate to contact my office. I should have read that at the beginning. Thank you. Madam Clerk, number five, please. Resolved, the mayor, city solicitor, and personnel director are invited to appear before the May 19th, 2014 Finance Committee to discuss the Mass General Law Chapter 41, Section 61A, as it governs appointments of temporary officers, specifically with the provision of Mass General Law Chapter 41, Section 61A, that states, but no such temporary officer shall be appointed under this section for a period longer than 60 days. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, Maureen Cruz, Personnel Director, Philip Nazarella, City Solicitor. Attorney Nazarella, good evening. Good evening. Mr. Chairman. Counselor. I filed this because, um, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but in my reading of this uh, Mass General Law, it does say, quote, but no such temporary officer shall be appointed under this section for a period longer than 60 days. So I figured um, we should call um, C City Solicitor Nasrella in to give us his opinion of what that means, no longer than 60 days. My interpretation is that you can only use it once, but is that not correct? That's not correct, and that interpretation has been made similarly by many other non-lawyers, but uh, within the legal community, it's, it's read somewhat differently. Um, I can backtrack a little and say that when these issues came before the law department, we researched uh, the, the matter very intently, very closely, um, and we are content, satisfied, and comfortable in having given the legal opinion and advice to the mayor that he was well within his authority to make such appointment in successive appointments. So for his whole term, um, for his whole term as mayor, we could have a temporary part-time police chief if he chose? Perhaps. What's perhaps mean, yes well, or no? Well, I can't give you yes or no, and the reason I can't do that, Counselor, yeah. is this matter, as you know, is part of an issue in some pending litigation. Because this issue you raise is part of pending litigation, I am quite frankly barred from discussing it publicly or privately with third parties. Uh, it would violate my fiduciary obligations as well as several other tenants within the uh, Mass Bar Association. So I cannot comment on, quite frankly, anything relative to my opinion on 61A. Well, I don't want you to uh, violate any type of, uh, any type of law, um, just as I, that's why I brought the chief in the other day to talk about making sure he didn't work over 960 hours. I don't want anyone to violate any law. Um, so I'm perfectly comfortable with that. But I thought the lawsuit uh, that you referenced was about uh, the chief being over 70, over 65, and not about the how many times you can use this temporary portion of the law. That may or may not be a collateral issue to the lawsuit. Okay. Do you, are there any other instances that you can tell us where this um, this uh, Mass General Law Chapter 41, Section 61A, has been utilized in successive appointments elsewhere? Oh, right here in Brockton. Where? Previously, with the uh, I believe the Treasurer Collector. Who was that at the time? Do you remember? Uh, How long ago? Uh, Martelli, Mr. Martelli. 
Okay. He was uh, he was performing and conducting his office under that particular How section. How many times was he reappointed? Uh, it was prior to my tenure here, so uh, I'm not sure. Who do you think? But I, I, I know it was for an, uh, an exceptionally long time. Maybe Ms. Cruz will be able to answer that. But um, can you name of this being used anywhere else beyond the treasurer and collector it, in 20, I think the mayor was mayor units at the time, it's back to the future. I just want to know like where else has it been used? I'm, I'm not sure. I didn't, when I do my legal research, I look for, I look for information which will sustain my position, not by way of popularity, where else it may have been used and how long it may sure. have been used. So I did not look into that and I'm unsure. So did you base your opinion that this law can be used multiple times just on the fact that Mr. Martelli was reappointed multiple times? It had times? nothing to do with Mr. Martelli. Okay, so what, what did you base, what's your rationale behind That's why? That's the part I am barred from getting into. Okay. And I say that with all due respect because I think you in particular know I try to be as responsive as possible when any of uh, the council has asked me questions. This particular thing is a third rail for lawyers. I sure do, and that is fine. So, um, is there any way you could write that opinion down? I and can't wait even whisper the, it to you. I'm, and no, I'm no, no, don't give it to me. <laughs> no, no, no. Write your opinion down and then put it in an envelope. And when this hearing is over, Counselor, give it to me. Counselor, can't? He, he already explained it. No, he's barred under the standard of ethics. As until a the until the, the pending matter, he can't. Until the court case is over. Correct. Right? So once this is resolved, we can call you back in to ask you what your rationale was and then you'd be able to give it to us, is that once correct? Once the case has come to a final conclusion. I think that is fair. Thank you. You're um, welcome. Could, and so my question, um, there really isn't an answer. So your answer is that it can be used more than once um, for reasons that you cannot share until the lawsuit is over. That's correct. And would everybody else that works for the city be barred from giving their reasoning why they think that this can be used multiple times? Only the, the lawyers. Only the lawyers. Other than, well, other than that, it becomes conjecture and public opinion. But How about Ms. Cruz, seeing as she's the head of personnel? I don't think she would she, be she, capable of answering the question. I think that's outside her scope. What that's she could answer is the question you asked about Mr. Martelli. Yes. But she can't ask in her, her capacity, she can't ask anything about the law. That's, that's fine. It's not within the scope of business. If I could please ask her that, I would appreciate it. Good evening, Ms. Cruz. Good evening, counselors. I'll Thank make you it very, very much quick. For being I here. believe I believe that Mr. Martelli was appointed for interim 60-day periods for at least two years, if not three years. That's off the top of my head. Do you know why that happened? I can't speak to why, no. Do you know? He may have, Mr. Kasseri may have had um, a couple of interims. I would have to look. I didn't come prepared to answer that question. Could you please look into that for me? And when you get a chance, could you please let me know um, how many times uh, this statute has been used to appoint temporary um, department heads in successive uh, appointments? And then if you could tell me what, date, what years that was done, I would really appreciate it. Certainly. Thank you so much, and thank you for being here. Thank you, thank you Mr. President. Mr. Counsel, is there anybody else? Counsel in the area, I'm sorry. If I might, Mr. Chairman. I, Absolutely, I, sir. I just heard uh, the building superintendent, Jim Kasiri's name come up, and if I'm not mistaken, I believe he received uh, several 60-days uh, appointments under then Mayor Harrington, and, he, and also even received a few under uh, then uh, Mayor Bel uh, Linda Belzotti as well. Um, Going back to the chief of police, and I know I was a young gentleman back then, but I think, and, and Attorney Nazarello, I'd ask you to check the book back several years, but I think if you go back to the mid-70s, you might find that Jimmy Cody may have been uh, appointed several different times, 60 days increments as well, and that was under Mayor David Crosby. As I say, I was a young gentleman then, but uh, still. Still a young counselor. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'd, I'd want to know that as well. So it's not just here right now today. It's been happening for several years. I believe you know there's I mean? a several history of it. Times. I, I simply stated I didn't check it, but I had heard there was a, a well-established precedent in the city of Brockton <sighs> of utilizing that particular section for successive reappointments. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Entertain a motion. Motion to recommend favorably. Second. Second. Motion made properly. Second. Favorable recommendation. Back to the full city council. All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed. Motion carries.
Favor recommendation back to the full city council. Madam Clerk, number six, please. Resolved that the police chief, Robert Hayden, be invited to appear before the Finance Commission to discuss any and all limitations placed on his ability to work more than 960 hours per year, pursuant to General Law Chapter 32, Section 91B and C. Invited Robert Hayden, Interim Chief of Police, Martin Brophy, Treasurer, Tax Collector, Martin Cruz, Personnel Director, Philip Mezzarella, City Solicitor. Mr. Chairman? Counselor. This was referred back to finance, awaiting um, the City Solicitor's opinion. Uh, City Solicitor Nessarella? I think um, the issue, I think there were two issues. One was uh, the definition of full time, and the other um, was, uh, what was the other one? It was when, what, do you, have you written these letters, Mr. Nassarella, Attorney Nassarella? No, I have not. Okay, can you tell me when you're gonna be able to provide those to us? Would you just, uh, if you, uh Kindly remind me what the specific issue was. I think that we would have to go back to the record to get the exact. Make a motion uh, to questions. postpone, then, Council. I'm going to make a motion to postpone. Second. Okay. Motion made, second, uh, properly second. Postpone to the next FinCom. Yes, please. <coughs> postpone to the next finance committee. All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed. Motion carries. Postpone to the next FinCom. Uh, Madam Clerk, number seven, please. Resolve that the city CFO confer with the assessor's department and get full accounting by year of any and all funds from reserve for abatements and assessment accounts that may be made available. Invited Johnny Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Paul Sullivan, Chairman of Assessors. Good evening. Mr. Sullivan, good evening. Good evening, Council Always President. good to have more than one Sullivan in a room. You know that, right? Tough. <laughs> Tough. <laughs> um, good evening, Councilors. Um, when I was uh, requested to um, come forth here this evening, I provided each one of you with the IGR from the Department of Revenue and the um, overlay surplus from the auditors at City Hall. And briefly, what the overlay surplus is, each and every year we need to set aside a um, specific uh, amount of monies for exemptions and abatements that we may have to pay each and every year. And that changes from year to year. It has to get certified by the Department of Revenue. And they have to make sure that we have sufficient monies in there to cover any exemptions, which would be elderly, um, any type of abatements, exemptions that we have to uh, provide each and every year. Um, and with that, I'll take any questions that you may have um, regarding it. Um, Council Dubois. Thank you, uh, Council, uh, Mr. Chairman, Councillor Cruz. Um, thank you so much for sending this along, uh, Mr. Sullivan. I really found it helpful. A couple years ago, I sat down with uh, Auditor uh, Chukran, and we went over these same numbers with this uh, reserve account. Um, the overlay accounts and I'm just on the back first you sent us a really great description of what the overlay is and that's from right from the from the state so that's wonderful and then you sent us a listing and I just want to make sure I'm reading it right because you know the computers that the city uses to me let being a technology person look like they're from like the 70s so I just want to understand that I'm reading it right so it says overlay 2002 and this is on page one um, and I'm seeing $3,713.12 in that. Is that correct? <coughs> okay. So even though there's a minus, it's a, it's a positive. And then in 2003, we have 8,000, 2004, 4,000, 2005, 4,000. So then it's like that. And then 2007, there's 3,400, th th $349,145 from the 2007 overlay account. Is That's that correct. still there? Uh, no, that has been um, reduced. Um, there was a $345,000, let me just make sure of the number. There was an overlay surplus declared of 345000 which leaves a remaining balance of $4,145.32. Great. And then for 2008, there's 207000 and some other, you know, $251. Was that reduced also? No. And 2009, was that one reduced? Nope, none of them. So the 2010 with the 500,000, that wasn't reduced either? Not at all. The only one that was declared a overlay surplus was 2008. And then there's like a million dollars in the 2011. Yes. When we have new growth, we have to set aside some monies in the event that we have to pay an abatement. Sure. 
and the Department of Revenue um, specifically was because of the uh, service hospital that came on, the old Cardinal Cushion Hospital that came on as being taxable. That was a substantial amount of growth for the city and the Department of Revenue was looking to say, okay, all of a sudden you're getting a high amount of growth. You need to increase your overlay surplus in the event that there is an abatement. Yeah. So that's why um, that's there. And each year, and each year we have to set aside sufficient monies that's reviewed by the Department of Revenue. So going forward, you'll see the increase each year. That's why. So when I, um, when I see, when I was reading the pages that you sent, the explanation that's from the state, yeah. um, it, and- Excuse me, Councilor, respectfully, um, I did not receive this information and, and I'm, I would like to follow along. Is there a way we uh, can- We won't be able to get a copy right now, Councilor. Could uh, we table this or until we can- Well, you don't have the floor, Councilor. It's not a point oh, of parliamentary okay. uh, inquiry, so. Uh, I request afterwards. I am happy to do that. I just want to ask one more question. No, you have the floor. Okay, um, Mr. Sullivan. So in one section, it says timing of determination. The amount of the excess overlay, if any, for all or particular years may be determined by the assessor on their own motion at any time and must be determined within 10 days of written request by the community's chief exec executive officer. Um, so. Is there, so is there a reason why we're holding on to 200,000, 200,000, 500,000 in 2008, 2009, and 2010 respectfully? Oh. Yes, each and every year we do have abatements that are filed. Sure. And we do have to keep sufficient monies on there. So until you exhaust any type of abatements, you need to have that money in there and it can't be touched. It's at the discretion of the Board of Assessors. So I went on the Department of Revenue and um, and I looked at some of uh, Brockton and other municipalities' filings. And does this, do these numbers appear in the schedule of outstanding receivables? Is that what um, R slash E 2013, R slash E 2012 means in the department? That would be in the overall budget. It is in there. We do have to set aside monies for abatements exemptions each year. But that, it, the numbers seem different, so I'm not sure if Each year it can change. Okay. So what you're saying is you have outside, outstanding liability for $207,000 from 2008. That you Potential. can detail? Potential. So it's potential. You don't know until the cases are settled. So you have $207,000 worth of outstanding cases right now for 2008. Potential. You have to set up a reserve. We could win every case, but what you're and saying then is that money could be declared as a surplus. So, okay, I just want to. Nothing just, more than protection. We need to have it because if you don't have the money in there, and there's a adverse judgment against sure. the city, that has to get picked up the following fiscal year. Sure, and I understand that. I just want to get my head around this. So, if I asked you for a detailed list of what substantiates holding $207,251 in the 2008 overlay district, would you have that? What we have are cases that are pending. You do. And you have, you have $226,784 potential that needs to be given out in 2009? The cases could run up that high, yes. Is there we any way you could give me a listing for 2000, 2008, 9, 10, and 11? And then when we table this, or postpone it, we wouldn't want to table it. When we postpone it, when we get that data from you um, and we take it up at the next finance or whenever, the fi whenever you think you might be able to um, give us that information, we might have a better understanding of where the money lies. Because as you know, we're going into a super tight budget. So if there's any way we can get a million dollars from the 2011 uh, tax abatement overlay account, we should do it. Council, this money cannot be touched while there's any cases outstanding. Sure, I would like to know the cases that are outstanding on each year. That's what I'm asking for. So that would be 2008, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Well, 2008, there's $4,000 remaining in that account. 2008. And there's... I thought that was 2007. I thought you said there was 3,345,000 withdrawn from 2007. No, 2008. So 2008, how much was withdrawn from that? There was a $345,000 surplus declared. Remaining balance is 4,000. 
$145.32. But the document that's before me shows $207,000 in the 2008. At the time of this printing, that's what was there. So it went up a whole hundred thousand before it was withdrawn down to three to four thousand. Uh, the, the amount was three hundred forty nine thousand. No, so the, maybe just the problem is I'm, I'm misreading it because to me it says overlay 2007 and in the overlay 2007 it says $349,145 and in the overlay 2008 it says $207,251. So maybe one of us is just a, just a little confused on which year and is that what it is? I can, I'm happy to come over and point to what I'm looking at. 2008. 207,251. Excellent. Yes. Now, okay. there was a withdrawal on that or no? Nope. It no. was on the 2007. 2007. Great. 2007. So, so I'm just wondering like what are the outstanding cases on 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012 dollars? There's telecom cases that have been you, pending for a long time, but I can get something them? together like, just, for you. Could you enumerate maybe you could do like an ex like can you just do a query oh. and export that information so we could just check it out because you know we're going into a very difficult budget period and we're going to have to answer the taxpayers based on um, our knowledge of city finances so I just want to make sure that we can you know look at the taxpayers and say that we've looked everywhere for but every you can't dollar. touch though just so you know you can't touch it unless there's a surplus declared Sure, yeah. but the mayor can ask you to do it, and you have to do it within 10 days, and you can do it at any time you'd like, according no, you can't. to no, the mass. No, if there's any cases outstanding, Councillor, you can't touch the monies. Great, so I would like to see the cases enumerated, if I could get we'll them. Do. Would that be okay? Yep. And Absolutely. then um, I, I don't want to um, stomp on any of my fellow councillors' questions, so I think at the end of this, if there could be just some courtesy given to Councillor Barnes that we were to postpone this to the next Finance Committee, I would appreciate it. And I'm done with my questions. I withdraw that request, actually. Okay. Make a motion. Then, then, then I'm going to make a motion to postpone this until we get the listing of the other um, cases that are, pen, that are outstanding for this over $2 million worth of money. Before second. I entertain your motion, anyone else on the uh, resolve? Do I hear a second? Yes, second. right here, sir. Second. Motion made and seconded to postpone this uh, to the next next FinCorp meeting. Um, Mr. Sullivan, would that be enough time for you, you think? Uh, it should be. Then yeah. that would be wonderful for me. Yes, please. Thank you. Motion made and seconded. All those in favor? Opposed? Postpone until the next finance meeting. Uh, Mr. Sullivan, if you could forward. Mr. Sullivan? <coughs> we forward those steps the, because I don't so think Just so you know, on the uh, cases, you're only going to have what the assessed value was at the time for that fiscal year. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. That's all but it's going to say. Could you forward the uh, forms? I don't think everybody received them. I didn't no, see them I in my didn't, email. I didn't so receive any. Then they were files. dropped into the mailboxes also. Oh, okay. Yep. Please. Yep. No, please. I made sure of it. Yes. Counselor. Please. I like paper. Right. You received yeah. it. Thank yep. You. Oh, we didn't receive Thank you. Councilors, bear in mind we're going to the summer session. Uh, we, we, we will be having a full city council Tuesday, next Tuesday. Monday's a holiday, and I will be calling June 9, 10, 11, 12 as budget hearings, but we will not be having another council meeting until the end of June because we're in summer session. That was point of information. Madam Clerk, next agenda item, please. Resolved that the Mayor, Chiefs of the City, Public Safety Departments, the Chief Financial Officer, and the Chairman of the Board of Assessors be invited to appear before a committee of this council to discuss the impact upon we the city in providing anything. such essential services to nonprofits, the community benefits to the city resulting from the mission of the nonprofits, and to review ways to strengthen the partnership between the city and its tax exempt institutions. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Richard C. Francis, Fire Chief, Robert Hayden, Interim Chief of Police, Paul Sullivan, Assessor's Chairman. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Council Cruz and I uh, filed this. <clears throat> we met with a few nonprofits uh, last October. We met with Maine Spring House trying to find a way to um, alleviate the cost to the city and its uh, yeah. services to the nonprofits and uh, other entities like National Grid or uh, Verizon, whoever you have used city services, but pay nothing uh, to the city at all. And, uh, I think uh, Chief Francis will really have a, an update on the amount it's cost the city, what different services are we giving, and to whom. So, Chief. Good evening, Councilor. Swing it. Um, 
first off, I'd like to state that um, I don't have any personal agendas against any of the nonprofits in the city. Um, <clears throat> they provide much needed services. However, <clears throat> um, how do I incorporate good business practices and try to maintain my budget when I have organizations that will not discuss pilot pro, uh, payments or try to find an answer to any of my uh, increased costs? Um, I just, you know, no one wants, no one wants to talk about anything. No one just, everyone just wants you to go away. Um, <clears throat> I have a, uh, figures from uh, some different entities. It's not all of them, and, um, but um, <clears throat> my total responses for last year were 21,500 incidents. Uh, EMS was 15,881. Um, the number of fire-related incidents has remained steady at roughly 5,600 runs, the same as we had back in 1980 when we had additional apparatus and staffing. So we're doing those runs plus all of the EMS runs. Um, I gave you pa uh, information packets tonight on how the EMS service was set up in the city, um, just so you'll, uh, at your leisure, read it, and um, you'll, uh, you'll have a better understanding how things work. <clears throat> um, total staffing is down, but the response is continuing to increase. For example, some, play, some of the um, <clears throat> nonprofits, Mainspring, um, we went there 294 times last year. Some of them are for fire-related incidents. Others, the majority of them, are for medical um, 911 calls. Um, <clears throat> High Point, 143 <coughs> times we've, we've been there. Uh, small part of them have been for fires. A large part of them has been for medical calls. Um, Neighborhood Health Center, we've been there 104 times. Some for fire-related incidents, mostly for EMS. South Bay Mental Health, all of their facilities together, roughly 98 times. Um, YMCA, 50. <coughs> Perkins Park, 50. Um, Signature Healthcare on 110 Liberty Street, it's a doctor's office, is down there. Uh, we've been there roughly 55 to 60 times a year for um, medical transportation. Um, so, uh, people have asked me before, what's the cost to provide these services? Well, there's a lot of different variables, but for discussion purposes, let's say it costs $1,000 every time we go out the door. So that means I spend $143,000 going to High Point, $104,000 going to the Neighborhood Health Center, and you just go right down the list. Um, <clears throat> this is in one year, I'm sorry, this is in one year. This is in one year, all right. Um, <clears throat> part of the problem is all these agencies, for whatever problem they have, they dial 911. I've tried to talk to them repeatedly about looking at the idea of having private ambulance transfers. Because once you call, once you go through the 911 process, you trip everything. You trip the ambulance, you trip us, you trip the police. Uh, a lot of times um, there are patients that could turn around and just be transferred in a, in a, uh, in, in a uh, non-emergency ambulance setting. Um, the thing is, a lot of these facilities, they're multi-community facilities. They don't just treat patients from Brockton. They treat patients from all the surrounding communities. I mean, uh, I, I believe uh, the last time when I was talking with Neighborhood Health Center, I think they said 20 or 30 percent of their clients are from out of town. So we're providing services to them. Um, you know, I get feedback from, from nonprofits uh, that they provide uh, jobs to the city. Well, who's getting all these skilled positions? Are they going to city residents? Who are they going to? Because the city taxpayers are supplementing all these organizations. We're absorbing all of their extra costs that, uh, you know, that they don't cover. Um, with that, I'll some questions. Well, there are also, I know Timmy, go. No, and, and then we were talking earlier too also about um, during storms or what have you, uh, like National Grid or Verizon or whoever, uh, they will have us cover 
or like that storm we had a few years back, all the down wires, we had to have either police or fire standing by, I don't know how many uh, days and how long, how many hours standing by their downed wires being live, and we weren't, get, we weren't getting anything from, uh, from the, for the, those utilities either, is that correct? That was true at the time. National Grid, after my testimony, cost them $20 million. They uh, turned around and they've become much more responsive to uh, uh, when we call them for wires down. Um, on, on that vein, Verizon Cable, their wires come down. We never can ever get anybody to come out. We end up having to cut the wires or tie them off so some young kid doesn't get hurt with them or get caught or somebody trip and get caught up in them. Um, all you get is an answering machine. Um, <clears throat> you know, the thing is, assisted living centers, they have a rule. When the patient falls on the floor, the staff doesn't pick them up. They call for an evaluation. We have to go down there and make sure the person's okay, and then we have to pick them up because the staff's not allowed to. <clears throat> I mean, it, it, these type of, of situations, I mean, they just go on constantly. And, um, there's, you know, there's, there's basically, there's, there's just no end in sight. I mean, we're not getting anywhere with them. So I, I think this idea of the, of the, of the payment of lower taxes is, is, is um, a path we have to travel here. And, um, you know, Hopefully, we can come up with, with, with a better dialogue with these people. I mean, you know, some people say, well, you know, I, I, I do something for the schools. Well, that's nice you did something for the schools. That doesn't help Chief Francis out. Doesn't help my bottom line. Um, so uh, with that, anybody have any other questions? The police chief is not here, but I, I, I don't, have you an idea of, I can imagine how many calls the, oh, I, may, oh, you do have something, okay. Oh, Lieutenant Crowley will be, okay, great. Chief, can you, can, did you, did you happen to state, I might have missed it, Bamsey, how many calls go Bamsey, to Bamsey? Bamsey's another one, they're, all, they're actually in that uh, document I gave you, that outlines a lot more uh, entities. Okay, we thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I did, thank you. Thank you. You guys want to floor, right? Yeah, I thought it was coming up, Lieutenant Crowley. How are you doing? <laughs> I know you were comfortable with that, Dad. It's all right. I wasn't sure if you actually wanted me or not. <laughs> are you buying? Oh, okay, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Go ahead. Could you just address these calls or what, what exactly? Uh... Um, we ran the total number of calls for the last two years. Um, so if you look in 1231-2013 to 1231-2013, the total calls to the nonprofits that are listed here, and they total out to uh, 1,282 calls. Um, we didn't individualize the calls to see what the purpose of why we went there, um, see how long we were there, see how many units went there. We just ran the numbers to see how many times we've gone. Um, if you look like, for instance, Brockton Hospital, we went there 507 times, but. Oftentimes victims appear at the hospital and they call us. Uh, we respond to car accidents, they end up going to the hospital, we go there to see them. So s sometimes the numbers you see aren't the actual numbers, but well, the incident probably didn't perhaps happen there, we just went there as a result of being called there. But for the overall, you can see the numbers speak for themselves. When you know. Now, I, I've heard, and I don't know if it's true or not, that is it true that when they have like either a psych patient or some, an issue, at Brockton Hospital that we would have to have a cruiser take that patient to another town? Uh, absolutely, when they have problems there in the psych, you know, they call us, um, but they're there for a medical reason. So if they need our help to transport, it would be in an ambulance, and you know, we'd assist them any way they needed us to. Yeah, okay, so yeah, you have enough police officers would have yes. to go and leave the city, take them to wherever. Wherever they have found a bed for that person. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm all set. Can we go ahead? Thank you. Council Cruz. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, sorry, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman. 
and I don't know whether you want to walk through this or the chief, but you said when they call 911, I mean, obviously we're a city and these are not all Brockton people, but we're, we're a city and we're going to attract area issues. But obviously we've got to find a way to get some of these costs under control or get the pilot program going. When you say they call 911, like for, I, was, I was very interested in your paperwork, it talks about uh, basically in the morning the nurse or whatever at, at, the, at Mainspring decides who can or can't, and obviously they're not all emergencies. But when they call 911, what trips in? What, what do we have to do by our protocol as opposed to if they call a, a private transport company? If you go to the microphone. When they, Chief, you know the microphone just so the people can hear you? I believe <clears throat> when they call 911, all right, <clears throat> the way the state protocol works, it tri trips a response from police, fire, and EMS if, they're, if, if, they're, if everyone's available, at least two out of three. Um, <clears throat> we have tried in the past to work with entities such as Mainspring about, about this situation here because a lot of times at 6 o'clock at night when they, when, they, when they open the doors to bring everybody in, okay. the intake nurse or, or caseworker turns around and they'll find different individuals that are intoxicated uh, under drugs or whatever and they have to be evaluated. They have to go to the hospital. Well, the thing is, is, is right now, currently, we have the four uh, advanced life support ambulances in the city to transport them. Um, no one's been inclined to turn around and venture with a private ambulance company. I don't know if it's about who's going to pay or whatever, but you know, the bottom line is, is this, is that the quicker you get someone to out and move where you're going, now you get the next, cust the next client available whether it's that or whether it's in a doctor's office. You know, once a doctor decides that you have to go to the hospital because you need more tests or, or whatever else, um, you're costing them money while you're sitting in that room waiting for an ambulance to come. It's much easier to call 911 and have an ambulance there two or three minutes than wait a half hour for a uh, private ambulance to show up just to transport you up to the hospital. I mean, that's basically that's, the, that's what the theme is. So when you transfer somebody from, say that, and, and again, it sounds like a non-emergency situation, how long are they tied up at the hospital? You have people tied up, at the, tied up on that call, probably. Um, depending on the situation, it may be only five or ten minutes. Or it could be longer. Um, sometimes, depending on the situation, they drive the ambulance to the hospital so the two medics can work in the back of the ambulance together. Okay. All right, well, thank you. I mean, I, I met with some of the nonprofits this week, and I mean, they, they don't seem inclined to lean towards the pilot programs, but they're certainly looking at this list of uh, police calls and the, what you've talked to us about. Uh, there are three or four major nonprofits that w we have to do some, some work with and figure out either a way to, to cut the costs and still help them with their services, or we, we need their help with the pilot programs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I just had a clarification relative to the police um, accounting when it says like the Brockton Housing Authority and it, it's mul multiple calls but it's listed many times is that the different high-rises yes sir okay Council. thank you thank you Council Stewart I believe you were up All right thank you uh, question for Chief Francis I think um, so uh, if I look quickly at the list it looks like the m most calls are coming from the Brockton Housing Authority or Brockton Hospital um, it's police it's the police that's the police Housing Authority is that am I, am I reading this correctly so the the most number of calls are coming from which institution is it the Brockton Housing Authority no you you have the police list I think that's the police, that's list. The police list oh the police list okay so maybe this is then for someone from the police department. Then. That's Mainspring, High Park. Okay. That's the biggest one's probably Mainspring. Okay. <laughs> so, so most of the calls are from, the, from Brockton Housing then? Yes, but some of the, like, for, uh, under the Brockton Housing Authority, they also own the property, the cluster housing up off of Walnut Street, Walnut and Turner, the houses in there, off of the new community on Dover Street. So it's not all the high rises, it's just property owned by Brockton Housing Authority. And then what's the thinking, because they're a government agency, so are, 
are there examples of lowering taxes from another government government agency to one from one agency to another? I do not know. Is that something that, the, that you guys are looking at, Mr. Mayor? I think the confusion, uh, Councillor, is that the Brockton Housing Authority has a nonprofit subsidiary that acquires and owns quite a bit of property in the city. So, from, so, so it's the subsidiary of the Housing Authority that owns what, 70, 80, I don't know how many do they own. I think some in the neighborhood have, no, I'm not sure the exact number, but they own a significant number of properties and they're continuing to acquire more. And each time they acquire one of those properties, they're typically multifamily properties and they come off the tax rolls and become tax exempt. So, so you're, and so they're on your list of nonprofits then that you're, okay. Right, the subsidiary of the housing authority. And then I'm a little confused by. But I believe that subsidiary owns a lot less than 70 houses. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I'll get the exact yeah. number, Thank Mr. You, Mr. President. Mr. Um, and then, so Brockton Hospital, I'm, I'm a bit confused. Maybe I'm looking at, so it looks like Brockton Hospital is next on the list. And this is also from the police log, I think, right? Um, so those are calls coming directly from the hospital? Yes, They're calls in which the police department responded to the hospital. I'm uh, sorry, say it again? The calls from when the police department responded to the hospital, not necessarily the hospital calling. More often than they've, not, they've called for somebody because something happened. But mixed in that number of people, that, when the police call out there, say you were in a car accident and we responded to um, give you your license back or, or pass papers with the other operator, that would go down as a call for service that we went there. Huh. You're at the hospital as a result of something else. So okay, not, I see. We're not there for an actual problem at the hospital. All right, so, this, so, that, so that number doesn't reflect what's happening at the other locations then? Because um, you're... Yeah, we'd have to go through the calls to see the reason why we were there. I see. Okay. Uh, so a question, I'm just sort of going through questions I had as the presentations were made, and then, so they're not, it's not, it's a little bit disjointed. And then, Chief Francis, the $1,000 that you say you're spending per call. Yeah, that was a, you know, we know it's a conversation number, right? But what is the number? Um, um, we're still looking at it. Um, there's a lot of different variables you could throw in there because, I mean, you, you know, do you turn around um, the price, the, the cost of the firefighters, the truck, the, the depreciation of the truck, the fuel, uh, the person answering the call? Um, there's a lot more things here. So I wasn't, I didn't have a number ready tonight. So I, I used, I know it's more than $1,000, but I, I, I used that number just as an example for, for uh, conversation but your plan is to provide those numbers to us as best I can counsel okay. I, mean, I think that's useful to, to kind of know what the real impact is um, so I am hoping that we'll be able to have those numbers in I, front I, of us I, I want to make one point here <clears throat> the VA <clears throat> the VA hospital which is now the VA Medical Center uh, a number of years back they closed their emergency department and never told anybody and <clears throat> this was just prior, prior to I was becoming chief and then when he became chief. And I started to try to figure out why we were going up there all the time. And what it was is, is they closed their emergency department so when a veteran showed up there for care, they had to ship them out somewhere. No one ever, ever told us anything. Um, and of course, they were getting tripped as 911 calls. Same as patients on the floor that had an issue. The nurses would call 911. It took me three years of going through a maze of VA uh, administrators till I finally found the one person that I could talk to. And it only became evident, it, I, I only found them out when I was up there for a thing on VA housing and I asked a guy, who is this person I'm supposed to see? It was him. And um, six months later, they now have, six months after that, they have a private company that takes care of 95% of their ambulance calls. So we're hardly up there anymore mm -hmm. in that regard, outside of the alarms going off. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, this is, this is the way things are. It's just a, a maze of trying to get through to find someone to talk to, someone that will listen with reason. And the, um, and I may be, uh, so based on recollection, are there not some communities that 
charge you for 911 calls? Or is the number of false, I mean, what is, is that something I, you're aware no, of or the, no? The, the police handle 911, so I wouldn't know. No, okay. Um, the question around the, the concentration of these calls in different places, is it reasonable to assume that these calls would take place anyway in the city and the fact that they're happening in these pocketed areas actually helps the city because then you can go to one location and service people versus, you know, sort of being in disparate places and sending trucks all over the city because the folks are in the city already. Well, um, as a taxpayer, I look at it this way. I turn around and pay the city taxes, and I expect when I call 911, I, I, I want a response. Well, what happens to that guy when he calls and we have to tell him there's going to be a delay in his ambulance because the four ambulances that we have are out chasing all these other calls? I, I appreciate that. I guess my question was if, if, and if you have 20 people making calls to 911 uh, because they're in the city, but 15 of those people are calling from one location because they're at the health center or the main spring or whatever, but they're in the city. Is it helpful to have 15 people calling from one location than 15 people calling from disparate locations throughout the city? I, 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 don't, I, don't, I can't follow where you're going here, Council. Okay, so I'm assuming the folks who are making the calls are in the city. They're here. Now we can argue that these different nonprofits are attracting them here, but they're, they're here in the city. Is it helpful to have a, a disproportionate amount of those calls, a number of those calls coming from sm a smaller number of locations so that you know where the folks are, you can get there quicker, you're not like sending trucks all over the city for these different phone calls? Well, it, it isn't so much that. It's just the idea that you tie up your available resources. Well, you're going to tie them up whether they're calling from one place or calling from different places. They're not all calling at the same time, though. Okay. I, I, okay. I mean, I'm just trying to understand. And then, then help me understand, so why doesn't the Brockton Police Department, because I think of, if I think of the $1,000 and the cost associated with having those large trucks go to these calls, so why is it that the police department doesn't have an EMS crew then if we're forced to... Constantly, you mean the fire department, not Fire department, what did I say? Police. I'm sorry, fire. Yeah. It was a Boy Scouts, actually. <laughs> so why is there not an EMS? Does it not make sense to have some type of EMS service within the fire department since we're serving we do. A, an EMS function here? <clears throat> we do. The apparatus goes out on the calls. <clears throat> this, if you, when you read the uh, document I put together, it will give you a history of how the EMS system was put together back mm -hmm. in the 60s by the Brockton Fire Department mm -hmm. when we had an ambulance. Mm -hmm. But I was thinking of these costs. I mean, so I understand that there's a whole different issue of the burden that these nonprofits are placing on the city, which is one totally different conversation. And I'm not trying to dismiss that conversation. The question, though, is with, with the situation as it is presently, why wouldn't the fire department rent or purchase ambulances that would be a lot less expensive to operate to respond to all of these EMS calls that you're getting on a daily basis? Well, it could, it could be more expensive. The, the other thing, too, is, is right now we don't have the resources and the city doesn't have the funds available to do something like that. But if we're spending $1,000 a call and we're responding to, I mean, so $1,000 per call for, one, for Main Spring House per year at 294 calls. That's a lot of money for one location that we're spending. I, I, agree, I agree with you, Council. That's why I say is, there's, you know, if, if, you're, if you're adverse to paying a payment in lieu of taxes, then work with us to help cut our costs a little bit. Well, that's a Can't even get anybody to do that. Well, I'm having a different conversation with you right now. So I understand that that's what we want. I'm, ask, I'm, asking, about, I'm asking an operational question within the fire department. And maybe this is a question for for uh, Mr. Condon in terms of cost and what's needed. But if I see Main Spring House costing us $294,000 a year right. to service that one location, 
I mean, how expensive would it be to, to rent an ambulance just for that? I mean, so, and that's just one example I, of the number of I think of the answer would be, would be the, the extra expense would be the ambulance itself because I don't think you would displace any of those costs. The costs that the chief is talking about are costs that are already budgeted, and he's allocating those costs to calls that he's making. So if you remove those calls from the budget and assign them instead to something new, which is an add-on to the budget, it seems to me that you're just adding cost. Well, wouldn't it be less expensive to operate those? I mean, what's the cost of wear and tear and maintenance and gas for those Probably, huge but trucks? You, you, you've got to look at how your fire department is currently constructed. Most of the calls it responds to are medical calls, not fire calls. Right. So Most of the apparatus is designed to respond to fire calls. And if you were to say, well, really, let's reallocate the, the structure of the, of the force and the equipment, you wouldn't have as many firefighters. You'd have a separate EMS force, and I don't think anybody's looking to take three quarters of the fire department out. But they're serving as EMS at the moment, though, right? When they, they they're all, you're getting double. You're getting double money in a sense because you're 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 getting an EMS response for at least a partial EMS response for every vehicle that goes out. You don't have a separate investment in, in vehicles which are ambulance vehicles. You don't have a separate investment for facilities to house those ambulances. And every time a fire truck is dispatched, on that truck is usually at least one and maybe two people who have some level of qualification in the EMS system. And sometimes they're even full paramedics. But if you were to say, in addition to that, we want to have a separate ambulance department for dispatching under the city's control. You'd have to invest a lot more money, and then the question would be whether you were overinvested then in the fire response apparatus, because mm -hmm. you don't have that many fire calls anymore. It's mostly medical. Now, that's my analysis of it, so when the chief says it's $1,000 a call, I think what he's basically saying is he's got about a $20 million budget. He's doing a couple thousand calls, or rather 20,000 calls, and there's, your, and there's your math on that, so each call's about $1,000. Mm -hmm. But those costs don't go away. If you got rid of some of those calls, you'd still have that budget. You're not going to reduce that budget to come down that way, I don't think. Mm -hmm. And has there been a, an analysis of that to bear out what your thinking is? It just seems... Well, so I think that's, I don't, I'm, Council, that's a separate resolve. If you want to talk yeah. about the city running its own ambulance and EMS for financial purposes and cost containment measures, that's a separate resolve. What the is the resolve result? here is relative to the impact the city on providing essential services to the nonprofits, the community benefits to the city resulting from the mission of the nonprofits and review ways to strengthen the partnership. Well, I say it's part of the impact, Mr. I, I, Mr. I Chairperson. I say it's not. Move on, please. Okay. So then we, um, I mean, I'm, I'm in support of the fact that the mayor wants to try to right. work with the nonprofits. That's not really the issue. I just think it, it has to be voluntary. So I feel as if we need to, from our end, sort of decide how we're going to handle uh, operations differently to address the impact if these nonprofits choose not to cooperate. Well, I, I can tell you a couple things for certain. First of all, it can't be a fee-based service. There are court cases on that, that, that you can't charge for fire runs or police runs to these facilities simply because they're not paying property taxes. The city of Boston tried to do that about 30 years ago in a case called the Emerson case and was shot down at the Supreme Judicial Court. So it can't be fee-based. Under the property tax law, it can't be imposed upon them. It has to be voluntary. But in terms of the cost that they're imposing on the on the city, the costs are real, but I don't know how much of it is really incremental cost or marginal cost because the resources are already sitting there. The chief described what might be an extra cost, and that is in the event that a call is coming in at the same time for a person who's got a fire and we don't have a piece of apparatus to respond. But I think if you think about, you know, if you're getting 20,000 medical calls in, or, or 15,000 medical calls and 5,000 fire calls a year over 365 days, there are a lot of hours where there aren't any calls at all. So the likelihood that on a lot of occasions you're going to have an inability to respond to a, a taxpayer's request for service because instead a not-for-profit is getting that service, I don't think that's too, too likely. That's why I don't know that if you're not looking to really restructure your fire department, it would be all that cost effective to say let's invest instead on a, on a separate ambulance department. Hmm. That, that, that's just my, my I, I haven't ever done a thorough, thorough rigorous analysis of that, but I'm, I'm pretty certain that it wouldn't, it wouldn't be cost effective unless you were willing to reduce the fire force. I see. Uh, so then this, the, the last question, which it may be similar to what I've just asked, but if we are looking at a total of 21,500 calls and 15,881 are EMS related um, of a city of size. So to me, that's 
is that 85% of the calls are EMS related? If I, a, a, a good number. I haven't done huge. that. At least three quarters and getting close to 80%. Yeah. So, so are there other cities that are sort of in the same situation yeah. where they've restructured their fire department to respond to the reality well, of that? The city situation? of Boston runs a separate uh, outfit. I mean, our EMS. size, because I'm imagining. Yeah, but I, don't, I don't think we, we, we're at a level where we can do that. And what's happened in the fire, I think you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, Chief, but over the last 30 years or so, because of fire codes changing, uh, the number of fire calls in any one of these, any number of these cities, not just here but across the country, number of fire calls is diminishing. But at the same time, the fire force has made themselves into a medical response force as well, and that's maintained their staffing levels at least to some extent. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. House Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Chief, Chief Francis, I know um, Mr. Condon was talking about not being able to impose fees for services or for runs, but why couldn't we, you, you, you had mentioned that, um, you know, places like uh, the assisted living uh, places here in the city, uh, often call you because a patient is on the on the floor and you have to show up and pick them up. Why couldn't we um, assess some sort of a fee, a service fee to those individuals? Because the ambulances, when they do respond to, uh, let's say, a car accident and they transport somebody to the hospital, there's a separate fee that's actually charged to the patients aside from the hospital bill. And I know that for a fact because I used to work at the hospital and often had to deal with patients coming in looking for, you know, why they, they've got two bills, one for the ambulance and one from the hospital. So if you're actually responding, let's say, to uh, one of the assisted livings down by the mall, why couldn't you just basically say, look, we showed up here, we had to do X, Y, and Z service. I mean, because when I think of firefighters picking patients off the floor because the institutions won't do it themselves. Why couldn't we uh, physically charge them a fee to provide those services, knowing that the ambulances can actually do it, so why couldn't we do it ourselves? Since, since you're doing something out of the ordinary, I mean, it's not, when I, when I think of a firefighter or a police officer, I'm not, I'm not thinking of them responding to basically put somebody in bed. That's true. I mean, the easiest solution would be for these facilities just turn around and train their people and have them do it and not even call us. Um. But um, what I'm saying, uh, the reason why I'm bringing that up is because at least from those facilities themselves, it might be a carrot in the, stand, in the sense to basically force them or at least to, to have them work with us in terms of working in this pilot program to say, look, from now on, when we're called to your facility to help you put somebody in bed, or, or, or pick, up, you know, pick somebody off the floor, or as long as it happens in your institution, we're gonna charge you a fee. And if you somehow tell them that you're gonna charge them a fee, I think they'll think, you know, think a couple times, or at least twice, either in calling you, or maybe not going, you know, in, in going along with the, uh, with the program that we're trying to, uh, to come up with you. Well, it, it, it may be something that we need to look in some more and come back to the council on. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm not exactly sure. Is there something that we can do on our, on our point or our side to straighten this resolve or uh, look into it in terms of assessing some sort of a, a fee for service for something like that? Do you? Yeah, I mean, we could, it would have to be in the form of a, a separate document. Yeah. Huh? Mr. Condon? Yeah. Have to be yeah, a separate I mean, document, yeah, absolutely. Because I, I honestly think that it, it, it's not going to help us with the uh, with the issues of main, uh, you know, the, the calls that the police is getting. Uh, and I, I I went through some numbers here myself, and I I noticed just in the police calls, you know, only 22 percent of them actually resulted in some sort of uh, an action from the police department. So 78 percent of the calls were resolved by by themselves in a way. So if we're actually, if it's actually costing us resources, manpower to do those things, I don't know why we couldn't you know, physically do that. And I think it would kind of either discourage them from calling you or knowing that they're actually gonna get charged and, and before you know, you're making uh, um, some additional resources anyways to help your cause out. 
Yeah, and, and the other thing too is, is Brocken is like an EMS training ground for a lot of companies. Um, one minute we could turn around and, and all the ambulances are, are in, in their quarters and nothing's going on. The next minute we'll call on the towns for, for, for an ambulance or a private company for an ambulance because we've exhausted them all. We go eight or nine deep. You know, it's, it's um, you know, I guess, so and when we go that, once we exhaust those first four ambulances, the apparatus set goes on those calls, has to stay with that patient until the ambulance shows up. So if, if it's going to come over from East Bridgewater or Whitman or wherever else, they stay with them until the ambulance gets there. I think that my answer, uh, the dilemma that we face here in the meantime, because we can't force these nonprofits to, to play ball with us. So if we can't force them to play ball, maybe what we might want to do is to, is to force them to pay uh, a fee, not, not to respond to the calls, as you had said earlier, that we can't force people to do that, but at least if they're taking resources away from us that our resources, our babysitting resources, I mean, if police officers are sitting there babysitting somebody, we should be able to charge them for those services, you know? in addition to, so I think that's something we'll all look at. Yeah, council, just we need to work with legislative council because an ordinance can't be used for punitive purposes. It would have to be a fair and reasonable and equitable, uh, but we could come up with something and work with Attorney Gilday, I suspect. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a good, it's a good um, yeah, thank line you, of thoughts. Thank you. President. Councilor. Thank you. I, I just would like to refer my fellow councilors to the Lincoln Institute. They have online a 30 page uh, overview of payment in lieu of taxes. Massachusetts is quoted extensively in it. Um, a, lot of, a lot of towns are doing it. So right now I have Boston, Belmont, Haverhill, JP, Lowell, Pittsfield, and Weymouth. So uh, it is like the wave of the future. But my question is for the chief. Chief, when I hear about paramedicine that's supposed to be coming in uh, from Canada, is that gonna solve some of our problems with these calls where you won't have to be transporting the people into the hospital, but the EMT person will go in, assess, call a doctor, and be able to prescribe the meds right there, or no? Is that a different issue? No, that is a, that is a trend that's uh, started out in, in uh, um, out on the West Coast years ago. It's been making its way across. Um, there actually are some private ambulance companies that are already up and running with that. Um, <clears throat> the um, supposedly it's it's supposed to um, cut down the number of ambulance runs, uh, but it's also supposed to generate a lot of extra revenue coming in by having um, uh, a lower level of service, uh, n not um, a de decreased level of service, but maybe a, a, um, a lower impact financially of, of services. It's, okay. um, um, but it is something that uh, um, actually the uh, professional firefighters of Massachusetts and the Chiefs Association are working together on. Okay, so it's, a, it's part of the solution, but not, it isn't going to solve our it's problem. It's not going to solve it no. right away. And I mean, the other thing, too, is, you know, who knows? I mean, uh, the mayor may turn around and, and very well be successful right. with, his, with his plan. And yeah. In Boston, they mailed a bill that looked like a tax bill out to all the nonprofits, and some of them paid them. <laughs> that, that is how I've heard it was instituted in Boston. Um, and then... So when I got into a fender bender, very small, no one was hurt, and the police came, an ambulance came. So my insurance company didn't pay for that ambulance? No, you didn't get transported. No one got transported, but the, the whole ambulance came, everybody came. So <clears throat> my insurance company doesn't pay for that. The city just sucks that cost up. No, the, the, the ambulance company, just, it just, they just charge it off. I mean, they, didn't, uh, they don't transport it. They may get a small, a small fee or something, but they don't get a, a regular, uh, what the regular rate would be. But the ambulance came, and because an ambulance came, the fire department came, and a police officer was there. And so, no, no, my insurance company didn't pay for that cost of the fire department coming down or any of that. No. That's all taxpayers' dollars. Okay, I just, I, I didn't realize that 100%. And um, some other towns create task force of, through the council to discuss pilots. 
Um, and there have been two pieces of legislation put through at the state level that both died last year. The first uh, created a commission to establish a mechanism for pilots, and the second um, would enable municipalities to level, uh, levy pilots up to 25 percent of taxes. So that's just a little bit of information. So I think it is a great thing that we're looking into, and thank you so much, Chief and Mayor Carpenter, for taking the lead on this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council. Anything else, Councils? Entertain a motion. Motion to recommend favorably. Second. Motion made properly. Second. Favorable recommendation. Back to full city council. All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed. Council Cruz. I make a motion to take item 12 out of order. Second. Uh, motion made properly. Second to take number 12 out of order. All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed. Motion carries. Council Cruz. Make a motion. Favorable recommendation. I make a motion for favorable recommendation. Second. Second. A uh, point of information on the motion, Council, as you know, this is a resolve that I filed uh, almost two months ago, actually, uh, and, I, and we kept it on the table because of tonight's conversation, um, and I thought it was appropriate. So uh, the Council has been talking along with the Mayor about the pilot program. Uh, motion made properly, second favorable recommendation back to the full City Council. All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed, motion carries. Favorable recommendation. Number 11, which is the last agenda item tonight. Resolved that the City Council hereby requests that a representative and or representatives of Aquaria appear before the Finance Committee to address questions pertaining to the desalinization water contract. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Conn, and Chief Financial Officer, Michael Thorson, Commissioner of DPW, Philip Nazarella, City Solicitor, and or his designee, Brian Creedon, Water System Manager, DPW, Moises Morente, Aquaria Water, Rebecca McEnroe, PE Project Manager, Aquaria. Mr. Chairman. Councilor Sullivan. Uh, Councilors, uh, some of you weren't on the, uh, the City Council last year. Uh, I filed a resolve last year, and uh, the scope was pretty much the same, asking the representatives from Aquari to come before the Council as finance. I, I, I can't remember if Mr. Parenti was here. I know Alfredo, Alfredo was here uh, last year. Um, we, we pushed it because we had asked specifically relative to marketing, and as a a clause under the contract and a, an obligation uh, relative to marketing. Uh, and at that time, they didn't have the information for us, so we, uh, we postponed it. And then when the legislative session died, uh, the resolve died. So I've refiled it. Um, I, I'm not really sure why some of these people were invited. I'm glad that they are. But really, I wanted uh, the Aquaria representatives to be here. We may have a few questions for Mr. Creedon. Um, Mr. Parente, thank you for being patient tonight and for being here. Good how are you tonight, sir? Good, how are you? Good, thank you. Um, so in a nutshell, I, I'm trying to find out, and I know my colleagues will have some questions as well. Again, last year, uh, we wanted to know um, how Aquaria was marketing the water, who they were marketing it, and in what fashion, such as trade shows like the MMA or, or what capacity. Can you, can you give us an update on, on how the marketing's going and what exactly is being marketed and how it's being done? Yeah, I, I was here last year and uh, basically explained that we went to every single town uh, that could be, uh, get word from Aquaria. We didn't put any uh, advertisement on, on, on trade shows or anything like that. Uh, we basically uh, have had discussions with all the towns and, and the city of Taunton, obviously, uh, along the pipeline and the surrounding communities. And those, I mean, every every town is aware of the of the project. Uh, recently, the town of Norton, actually, if, uh, I don't know if you are aware, uh, filed an ENF uh, to build a, a facility to remove iron and manganese from from their from from some of, the, uh, of their wells. And one of the options they had to consider was Aquaria. I don't know why they took that 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 option, but I mean, uh, they are aware of the uh, of the project, and we've been. Uh, meeting with uh, with uh, uh, representatives uh, from from those towns and extensively. So you just you're not getting any positive results. No. No. Wh why is that? Is it too expensive? I mean, that's what I'm hearing from other towns. It's just not cost efficient to do it. Is is that what you're getting feedback? Well, we we have worked with them. Uh, we have even drafted uh, two two separate agreements uh, for uh, uh, non willing and willing through. Uh, the they are really the demand right now is is lower than than previous years. So that right now they don't have a demand to 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 basically uh, join Aquaria, and and that for that re for that reason alone, basically they are not taking any work. 
how how do you go about i guess how frequently do you go about the marketing i mean if you go to the town of easton you know last quarter do you, do you keep up how do you do it i mean are you just going to the communities that that abut the pipeline is that what you're doing yeah but i they all even they all have uh, t connections yeah. i mean they are not connected but we've been working with the uh, with the water departments for many years to, to locate those T connections. And we did uh, extensive engineering work just to, to, uh, to locate those uh, T connections. They know they are ready to go. Uh, they will have to do just a small investment to connect to us, but they, they, have, they, have, they have not done it. I don't think the state is, is, is helping us either. I mean, it's, uh, they reduce the, uh, the per capita consumption on the, uh, on the city of Brockton and they would probably do the same to the uh, joining communities. Uh, recently, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, town of Norton actually uh, requested to build uh, a new facility, and they have granted the, uh, the uh, building that new facility when we have one that is up and running right now. And I mean, they could just uh, you know, connect Willing through Easton, and it will be a matter of months instead of years. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I said last year, and I'll, I'll say it again, I mean, from a business standpoint, I mean, you have a great customer. You know you're getting millions of dollars every year from the city of Brockton, but it is what it is in terms of a contract. But I guess from an incentive marketing standpoint, that, that's what confuses me because when I go to trade shows, I went to MMA again this year, yeah. you know, why, why wouldn't you go to something like that to, to reach out to other communities in the Commonwealth? I mean, I know there's a distance, geographic distance, but why wouldn't you do that? Because we, we have gone to all the communities that we can deliver water to. I mean, there is really, I mean, it's really uh, pointless to go, for instance, to, the, uh, to, the, to Cape Cod, because we are not gonna be able to deliver water right. to them. Right. So basically, we, we have worked with the communities that we can deliver water to, uh, and, and, and basically those are, those are our targets. I okay. mean, there's really nothing much we can do to go to the, uh, to the north of the state or to the... Uh, to yeah, the, I mean, it's uh, a finite number of, of, of communities. Right. Right. I understand that. Now, now the, the ownership of Aquaria has changed from, from when I first got elected. Could, could you explain to me what's the current ownership structure? I know there's owned, some confusion about that. Aquaria is owned by, by two companies, actually. Uh, it's owned by Inima and uh, Bluestone Energy Services. Uh, the, uh, ownership, uh, the ownership, uh, ownership change was on, on Inima, so it, which is the, was the parent company of Inima. Uh, the previous company was OHL, and the current company is uh, GSCNC. Okay. Now, how many people actually work at the plant currently on like a full-time basis. If I went down to the plant tomorrow, how many people are working there for you guys? Seven people. Seven full-time? And who, who does like the testing of the water? Is that internal or do you... Ex Both, is, actually. It's internal and external? Yes. Who's the external tester? It's, uh, I, I, would, I, I, I could get back to you, but I mean... Yeah, if you, uh, could, if you could, yes. because I know this has been a hot issue for, for many years, sure. you know, and, and, and I think it's well deserved to be a hot issue um but i know i mean i've i was reached out just today actually and somebody asked me some questions um you know about an epa violation in 2013 i don't know anything about that was there an epa violation to your best of your knowledge no okay okay um i think i think really i'm not gonna you know take too much of your time but i i think what i'm trying to find out so i can report back to my constituents is that Aquaria, and this is what you're telling us as a representative of Aquaria, you have, quote, marketed to municipalities, communities, cities and towns that are along the pipeline, and that there's no interest, and there hasn't been any interest since day one, correct? No, there was interest. But, but there's uh, never a finalized deal. The only deal right. you have is the city of Brockton. Right. Now, correct. if the city of Brockton tomorrow said, turn up the pipe, we want the water, could you guys produce that within 24 hours? Well, we have done that recently. For no, I mean, if we just want to use that as our primary source, could you do that? Up to the fixed commitment, yes. Yeah. How, how long would it take to, to get it up and running? Well, last time they asked us for work, it was actually a matter of 24 hours. 24 hours. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Creighton, you can come up. 
flushing in the area of where the vault is, which would be the uh, southern end of Pearl Street. Yep. Uh, when we were flushing in that area, we actually called it up for those two days we flushed there. We just made a normal call, and it's just 24, uh, 24 hours. They test it uh, for uh, coliform, and they test it. They, they're delivering and wasting about, I don't, I, I don't want to say that I have the figure, but it's, uh, you know, maybe 10,000 gallons or more a day. They're, they're bringing water in, but in order to deliver it to the city, they have to have it tested. So it's the doing of that lab, or paying of that lab work that is the contract we're stuck with. This is uh, about 36% of the water department budget. I just, yeah. that fuck, that, just that fixed cost. So that lag, that lag time is 24 hours? That's yeah, the lag yeah, time? They, they, yeah, they, that lag time, they, they, they have a, a very professional, who actually who spoke with the Water Commission at our last meeting. Who, um, who, who I don't know if it's you, Mr. Creed, or you, Mr. Prenti, who conducts the routine maintenance testing? Like, who does that? Is that, again, internal, or is that's that? That's the obligation of the water the right, company. Right. That's internal. Yeah. That's all, it's all done by Aquaria. It cannot be done by, you know, the city. It's crazy. Are there any? It has its own. The city, right. I just didn't know if, if you hired a subcontractor to do that. You do it all internally, meaning, you meaning Aquaria. You do it, everything's internal. Right. Do you have any? Oh, no, some of the testing, some of the testing must be done by, you talking about testing, in fact. Yeah. Testing is done by, must be done by a certified lab. Uh, we in the city of Brockton actually have, are certified in certain testing uh, that we do at the, at the treatment plant. And Wasn't there an entity from Woods Hole down in Falmouth, Woods Hole, that did some, some testing for Aquaria relative to our water? Does that ring a bell at all? No, I don't, I don't know which lab was used. Yeah. I, I can get back okay. to you on the labs. We've used uh, several labs, so I'm not sure. I couldn't, I couldn't tell you what the lab is okay. right now. All but right. I, I will, I will, I'll find out for you. And, and, and relative to the, the change in ownership, and are, are there any, any liens? Has anybody filed, filed any liens? Since we're a good partner, the Brockton and Aquare, is there any liens that you know on, on the property? For the uh, change of ownership? Yeah, no. on the no. asset. No. no? No. Okay. Okay. All right, thank you. I'll send it back to you. Thank you, uh, thank Councilor. You. Councilor Cruz. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Parente. Parente. Um, were you aware that Holbrook is about to join the uh, MWRA? Yes. And give me a reason why they're going MWRA and not with, not with us, not with you. Well, they, they have to do an evaluation. I mean, I, I cannot tell you why they are doing that. Okay. I just, I, I spoke to an official there who told me he, they continually had trouble getting, getting answers, and uh, they decided to go with the MWRA. That's what he told me. So, well, they I, never, uh, they never. The the, uh, the most recent uh, meeting that we had was the, with the uh, with the Tri Town Development, but not not with them. Okay, Holbrook's not part of the Tri Town, I don't, I don't believe. Mm. But I mean, not 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 with them. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Barnes. Actually, the, the, the Tri Town development, that's my question. Is, um, if I understood you correctly, you said that, uh, is it Rockland, Abington, and. Abington, Abington Rockland, and. Weymouth. Let me, Weymouth. Weymouth, Abington, Abington, Rockland. Was it Weymouth or Whitman? Weymouth. 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 Okay. Um, now, you said that they didn't, I guess, catch on or, or join on. Um, my, my question, I guess, is just a different form of the other questions that uh, my colleagues have asked. Is it because maybe the system doesn't support like a, the regional joining or so? I, I don't know. I just well, I believe they, they, they were more interested in purchasing from from the uh, from the from the city itself. I mean, I'm not uh, I'm not sure why. I'm not sure what the cost that the the city was offering, but they were. More, I mean, from the minutes that I had. They, they were considering city water, okay. not the city of, uh, of Brockton, though. Of Rockland? Brockton. I, 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 I cannot tell you. I mean, they, they told me they were considering city water. I'm not sure who, who, uh, who they were going to buy it from. Okay. When was the last pitch meeting that you were involved with, for instance, to another city or town, surrounding town, to say, hey, Well, I'm not involved on a, on, on a, on a, daily, on a database. It's actually, my office is not, is not here. It's actually in Florida. Oh, you're from Florida? Yeah. Oh. Okay, are there any notes or anything, um, like session notes or something, kind of explaining? The people that we talk to, yes. Yeah, when they go there, why, you know, everything is no? 
I mean, we've, we have worked with them in, in many occasions to even, I mean, for instance, the, the uh, town of Easton, they have a connection ready to go, and they are not uh, even considering actually uh, purchasing from us. Yes, yeah, the same that, that, thing that's with asking, Are there any like meeting notes or you know some kind of um, uh, uh, what were they called? Uh, yes. Any kind of uh, just anything? Why they said no? I mean, it just kind of you know, going and say, hey, you want to hook up to our thing? No, oh, okay. You know, I mean, that, that's kind of how it sounds. There's really no explanation. Well, the, there is like, interest, but it, there, there is no need right now for them to purchase the water. That's, that's basically what they are telling us. I mean, uh, I, we have had uh, many meetings with, I can show you the list of, of uh, towns and, and cities that we have actually met with, and actually uh, even private owners. And uh, like the, uh, the Triton Development, uh, the Taunton Casino, Ericsson Retirement, I mean, we've we've talked to all of them, but I mean, uh, I mean, they know we are th we are there. I mean, they know they know the facility. They've been invited to to see the facility, so it's not yeah. that's that they don't know that the uh, facility exists. I mean, uh, we are uh, actually when they file for uh, for a permit, they have to consider us. Okay, and then uh, I guess to piggyback on what my my colleague said. Um, and take it further. Are there any plans to maybe change your marketing strategy and your presentation strategy if everybody that you present to says no? The uh, the current. I mean, if you're talking about pricing or anything like that, I, I don't. Mean, whatever the problem yeah. is, I don't know. I, the uh, I mean, uh, the only communities that can take, we have talked to. I mean, that's that's a reality. I mean, uh, there is really no one else that we can we can we can talk to that can actually take word from us. Okay. Thank you, sir. Was that Council? Yes. Council Dubois. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Um, what can we do to help you wheel this water? I mean, who, who would be the person that goes to these meetings? Who, who went to the Tritown meeting? One of your Actually, on that one, I, I, was, uh, I was there myself. You went th were there other people with you, or did you yes. just go by yourself? No, no, no. There were other people with me. Were the other people folks that work down at the plant? Or were there, is, there is a project people? manager that is always on, at, the, at the plant that, that came with me at the time. Well, another two people, yeah. I've made this offer before, and I'll make it to you and okay. uh, Mr. Credence here as well. I'm thinking that maybe the selectmen in Holbrook would have liked to have seen maybe a city councilor at your meetings. I'm wondering, are you getting enough local or a water commissioner? Are you getting local help? Because you know local people like to work with local people. And where you live in Florida, it may, maybe there's some kind of disconnect where the selectmen who might have lived in that town their whole lives or multiple generations sees someone from Florida and they're like, oh, I'd rather go with the MWRA, thinking somehow they're more local than Aquaria, I'm not saying that that's rational. I'm no, just no, wondering. I'm, do you think we have anything? people here, and they they are available for any 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 meeting that they 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 may want to have. So, so you have local people at these meetings yes. when the sales are being yes. pitched. Actually, we have a project manager that looks for the uh, operational maintenance and or, uh, the overall project, and she's been actually to uh, to many of these of these meetings. How's the meeting with Tri Town go? Well, the... Uh, There's this controversy about that right now, and it's all about the water. There was really nothing, uh, to tell you the truth. I mean, we went to a meeting. They, uh, we talked about rates. Uh, they had those from the past. Uh, they, there was really nothing. Are your rates higher or lower than MWRAs? Do you know? Well, it depends. MWRAs rates depends on, the, on every single community. So uh, the, the rates that we have to propose are rates that have to be higher than the ones that uh, the, Brockton, the city of Brockton has. Okay. So, so that's basically the reference that, uh, that we provide to the, uh, to the towns and cities. So around. I could just look at MWRA rates unless you, do you know them right now or no? Well, they are, they are not disclosed. I mean, if you, okay, if you so go to the webpage, I mean, they are not there. Oh, the, they're not there. Right. Um, I think Council, Mr. Creed. There is a, a report MWRA puts out, and I believe I sent it to all of you, but the MWRA rate report, uh, if anybody's interested, could you send that every, again? Do you think that the... It was the, sent out in February to you. Okay. Do you think that the MWRA's rates are comparable to Aquarius? Yes. As a matter of fact, the rates that are low are of Brockton's. Brockton's rates are low. 
Good to know. In comparison to others, but of course we can't fix streets. So our water rates are low compared to other communities. That's what you're saying. Of the MWRA, yeah. Of the MWRA. Well, that's a bit of good news. Where everybody's, you know, we have high taxes. Our water rates are lower than surrounding communities. Oh, they're, good they're lower, and you, we can't get the work done. Yeah, that's yeah. not an issue here. That's true. Yeah, this is the aquarium. Yeah. Well, we can't get the um, and then I think. And, I th and the water commission actually has spoken to both the the Star Starworth or whatever the name of the corporation yeah. is now, but the corporation at the Naval Air Station, which is Weymouth, Abington, and Rockland is different from the Holbrook Tritown, which yes. you, you're referring to. Okay, yes. that's, that's, so the that, that's, a water, the, that's a water district. The Tritown is the Navy base, Braintree, right? Braintree, Braintree, Randolph, Dolphin. and yeah, Holbrook. That's right. Yeah. Yes, and that is a different issue. It's di those are two different yes, issues. Yes, I, I realize that, yeah. Okay. But thank you very much for clarifying. I do appreciate it. So what I've been told from water um, engineers and advocates is that when a community even thinks about coming on to your water source, if it's an interbasin transfer, meaning their natural water aquifer, you know this more than I do, probably explain it to me, is not the one um, where the water is going to be withdrawn from. So say, um, um, I don't know how to even explain it, so say uh, Holbrook wants to get water from us and the water's coming from, I think this might be a Brian Creedon question, um, the water is coming from Dighton, the, uh, the water basin in Holbrook is different ecologically than the water basin in Dighton and therefore the Mass um, Department of Environmental Protection is making Holbrook jump through all these hoops to get an interbasin water transfer permit. And in order to get an interbasin water transfer yes, permit, that's correct. they have to prove yeah, to the correct. state that they've invested a certain amount of money in just closing the leaks to their own pipes because the environmentalists find a big problem with transferring drinking water from one water basin into another water basin, almost like they don't want you to steal somebody else's water or a fish's resource to get out to the ocean. So is that causing you a fiscal problem? Because when I talk to other municipal elected officials, they're saying that that's a problem for them, that they don't, the, by the time they were to jump through all the hoops that the Department of Environmental Protection is putting on them, they would have expended a considerable amount of dollars. Is this what you're hearing, Brian, or am I getting this yeah, straight? No, you're not incorrect, but to it, understand that their, their wastewater basin presently is with the MWRA. These are MWRA communities that, in the case of Holbrook, okay, uh, is looking at tying in their water service too. MWRA water is not, neither one of them are unreasonable, but interbasin transfers are a hoop. It's a hoop that Brockton had to go to. Now we take our water from the Taunton, uh, out of the Dighton from the Taunton River, and we dump it back in the Taunton River, but that's a different basin down in Dighton than it is up here. But it seems like that was an issue that we dealt with in the early 1900s, and the rules and regulations oh, no, no. now are much stricter. That. We dealt no? with that in the, uh, in the mid-2000, 2005, okay. 2006, okay. Yeah. And before how we got permitted. Did that cost us a lot of money to get all that squared away? It costs money. I know, 100,000, 200,000. Okay, so. I'm, so, I would be completely speculating. So n it's not necessarily cost prohibitive. You're saying that it that is not isn't cost prohibitive. It is time, sometimes time prohibitive, and cost, cost, aggravant. I don't know. You know, each town would it help? We have sat down. We sat down with Holbrook, with selectmen from Holbrook. All right. They uh, and we even discussed. There are other ways of uh, offering sales, but. What our, the killer in our situation is the fixed costs. That fixed cost, which is now for the full operating plan of 3.65, all right, that we could ask for at any time, of course, is trying to, you know, we don't need 3.65 right now, all right? Right at this moment, Silver Lake is about two inches down from full. All right, it's not a, Bless you. The, the, they are, anytime you make it more difficult, an interbasin transfer, 
yes, this would be. Anything under 100,000 doesn't have to jump through hoops. Anything over 100,000 has to jump through hoops. All right. The 10 percent rule kicks in. That's the leak thing you're talking about and other things. All right. So that there are various, various things can keep Do you in. think that these other things that you're talking about are also preventing the, the, the sale of this water to municipalities? They're affecting it. They're affecting, They're affecting it. it. Yes. And the fact the, that we don't the have state, a drought. For example, the state not requiring a, 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 an, e, uh, an environmental impact report in the case of Norton because the Department of Transportation is holding up the town of Norton to put a pipe across 495. So it's the state, the, the state is making the rules, the state that is causing us the aggravation, and it's the state that we voted this contract for. Am I hearing, I'm hearing rumors that the state might purchase Aquaria, is this true? No, there's no rumors, but there was. I there heard was, rumors, there was, saying Well, that true. would be wonderful if they, decided to do that and set up an authority, but that was tried in the uh, 1999. I think I shared with you a copy of the legislation that was done in 1999 to try to make it an, an authority. If it was an authority, it would be something which might be more palatable and it is easier to join MWRA than it is to join Aquaria, in my, in my view. I agree. Mr. Parente, right? Am I saying your name correctly? Do you know, have you heard of any chances where the state might be working no. to purchase Aquaria through MWRA? Well, they haven't talked to us, the lawyer address. And include it into its capacity? No? No. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council. Council Monahan. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Condon, or I don't know, Mr. Sir, uh, what is the deal with the per capita thing that's making it difficult also to sell to these different cities and towns? Yeah, well, you seem to understand it. Last time we were talking about that. Uh, it's, a, it's a condition of the permit. The, the Aquaria permit requires that any new community, Brockton has to comply with this as well, that any community which uh, seeks to obtain a permit to purchase water from Aquaria has to commit that its uh, per capita per day consumption would be 65 gall gallons per capita per, per day. There aren't many communities which are close to that level. Brockton is, and it w basically implies a significant investment in uh, water conservation to achieve that. So that's anyone that wants to buy from Aquaria has to agree to comply with that. Right. So if none of the communities we can sell to, uh, does the supply cannot meet that requirement, then we can't yeah. sell water. They're not eager to do it. You know, I, I think I th Councilor Dubois was on the, uh, on, I think on the right track there. I think one of the major problems, I mean, there have been a number of reasons that this, this project hasn't successfully sold to other communities, but a major problem has been state regulation. Okay, I mean, so just a simple way, like you just said, if, not, if none of these communities we can sell to meet that requirement, then we can't sell to anybody. We're stuck with this. It doesn't seem to me like there's anything we can do. It's on the, it's on the permit. It's on the Aquaria permit. That, that stipulation is on their permit. So, I mean, is, is there any way that we can go to our state delegation can do something about that, or is that just across the state? And like well, nobody seems to want to cross the, uh, I mean, that, um, I'll be careful with this. They, they're, they're pretty much beyond political influence, I think, those environmental regulations. Oh, you got a point there. Yeah. You got a point there. So, I mean, I don't know. I mean, if we, they don't meet that requirement, we can't sell it. I don't know where the heck we go with it. Right. But I think had, had, um, had development in southeastern Massachusetts proceeded at the same pace that it was in the late 90s when it was the fastest part, growing part of the state, it could be then that the communities would have been willing to make such a commitment because they would have needed the water. But not needing the water, if their need is marginal or incremental or periodic as opposed to permanent, then they're not willing to make that, that commitment. The same thing with respect to the pricing in the contract that Brian alluded to. I think we've had discussions with Aquaria over the years that if there is a, an opportunity for Aquaria to make a sale to another community and the pricing in the contract that requires a query to not give a better price to anybody else than they give to Brockton becomes an obstacle. We would always be willing to look at that because there's a benefit to Brockton in the long term for additional sales. But that hasn't been really the issue. The pricing hasn't really been the issue. The issue has been as much as anything demand and conditions that the community would have to meet to say we want to satisfy that demand from Aquaria. So we're at a dead end? 
No, um, you know, time passes. Well, I mean, right now. <laughs> you know, sooner or, sooner or later. I don't think you can Hopefully believe Hopefully there'll be a drought sometime. I don't well, know. Well, you know, I'm really, we've been, we've been in a period of extraordinary rain. That's, that's number one. And time passes, and in time, economic conditions change. I don't think that the initial analysis that said that this fastest-growing part of the state uh, would continue to be a, a fast-growing part of the state was incorrect because most of the land for development in Massachusetts is either way out west we're down in southeastern Massachusetts. Well, we're closer to Boston. So I think development will eventually occur. But we had a pretty nasty recession which affected real estate development. That's what I think as much as anything, that's the, that's the problem. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you Mr. Council. Councilor Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Parente, uh, what is your job title at, at, at Aquaria? At the company? Yeah. General manager. General manager. Um, I know the uh, counselor from Ward 2 was uh, brought up this question earlier in terms of the requirements for Aquaria, but is that the same requirement that actually applies to MWRA as well, or does not apply to MWRA? Which, which requirements, sorry? The, the, the comment that uh, Mr. Condon was just making a few seconds ago as far as the... Okay. Uh, yeah, the, the actual the 65 gallon per capita was, in, was on the uh, Water Management Act permit that the city of Brockton filed with... Uh, with the state. But um, so that doesn't apply to M MWRA? No, it's. Those, those, those are registrations. Mm -hmm. Our water that we take from the Silver Lake region, all right, is a registration and they're not affected by the 65 yeah. per capita uh, per day okay. regulation, which occurs to permits. Permits are much more severe than our registrations. Presently, uh, they're trying to even make it even more difficult in the issuing of permits. But the other towns, like Holbrook, for instance, if they're hooking up to the uh, MWRA, don't they have to MWRA go through some sort of... MWRA holds, like Brockton, holds a registration in... It, they, they don't have the same kind of permit that we do. The permit we have with to take Silver Lake water, to make available Silver Lake water, is not the same permit that we have to take water from Aquaria. One is a permit, another is a, 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 a registration, if you will. Now, what prohibits us from becoming the entity, the city of Brockton itself, since we're the ones paying $6 million a year to a company that's not providing a drop of water to us, what's to prevent us from assuming the role similar to what MWRA does to some of these other communities? Meaning that, uh, meaning I, that we, they hook up through us it, at the same time we provide them with the It would be interesting to look at it financially. And I believe the mayor actually brought it up in his, uh, in his campaign that, you know, it may, be, it may be something that's worth looking at. But I don't think that it's, that's not done by the Water Commission. It is something which is done by, uh, you know, and, and I, that, has, that discussions have occurred over the past, I believe. But it's not... Would it be better? It, it would because at least we'd get an asset. Right now we have zero asset from our investment in Aquaria right now. But Mr. Creedon, um, not a day goes by that most of us aren't getting phone calls from teachers, uh, folks in the school system petrified that the, the budget's gonna get cut yeah. and that these children, uh, you know, they're hurting in, in terms of classroom sizes to begin with. We are, in reality, opening the window of this building and pitching out every year around six million bucks of yeah, water that we don't get, not even an eye drop. Councillor, we've lost in the city of Brockton water division about eight to 10 personnel over the last, since 2008 when the Aquaria contract came in, into being. We've lost workers so that we're not replacing pipes in the same way we replace pipes back in 2008 and matter of fact our water commission will be sending communications that there is a need for a rate increase There's but that's not it's not not this discussion here is a query is it worthwhile it's worth discussing but i don't think this is the place to discuss it right now uh, well you know what um well, you know. I, I think it might be the place because we're talking about okay. we're talking about a budget that's coming up yes that has shortages all over the place. And yes. we've got $6 million sitting here of payments that we have to make to this company that we don't get a dime back in return. So 
I think mm. I think it's worth talking about, uh, oh, I, and I, I agree, think it's I, worth. No, let me finish for a second, and I think it's worth, you know, getting a, a query on board to help us push this issue, since they've tried, and, and it's been said all over the place that they tried to advertise and promote and, and done all those other things in a, uh, from the conversation you just had a few seconds ago with, uh, with, with the Council for More too, that these smaller communities can't do that. So I think we have to circumvent the whole system and basically go at it because I frankly don't see us spending, I think we've spent over $30 million. $33 million. $33. Yeah. Uh, what's a, you know, $3 million among friends. Uh, $33 million in payouts to a company that we, again, we haven't gotten a drop of water from. To me, that is. No, we have gotten water from them. We have gotten water from them. They are responsive and we need water. However, we haven't got any, no value to the money we spent. Have we gotten $33 million worth of water? No, you just said we don't. We, we, no, we, I'm sorry. We have no asset value. But, but we haven't gotten... We're getting, a, we're getting a little off, a little off track, off. And, and I'm not yeah. disagreeing with what you're saying, Council. Mm -hmm. I think that could be a separate resolve to be discussed. It might be, but I'm going to go back to... Uh, Just go back to... To the... To the yeah, go ahead. Thank the Aquaria you. general manager. There's um, an overwhelming sentiment here in the city of Brockton that your company hasn't done enough to promote this new water resource that we have. Um, frankly, we should, be, we, we should be seeing billboards all over the place, advertising the water down on Route 24. We should be seeing billboards in the city advertising this new water, founded water. I, I believe there's a contract that says, I'm a newbie here on, the, on this council, but there's a contract that exists out there that says that you will spend a decent amount of resources to promote this resource in marketing. And there's quite a few of us in this community that feels that you haven't done that. You have not done what you said you were gonna do. And I believe as the holder of the purse in this city, it's our responsibility as council people to basically somewhat hold you accountable for some of the things that you're not doing. And if you have a contract in place that says that you are gonna, you know, promote this to communities throughout. I mean, I, Stoughton, uh, next door community, is hooked up to the MWRA. So they're getting water from God knows where into Stoughton, which is just not next door to us. So in reality, you know, if, they're, if these communities around us, they should be hooking you know, their water to us you know, for the cheaper water rates and some of these other things that we can afford to do. But I mean, going back to you, I mean, it's, it's like, to me, it's, it's, it's mind boggling and there's a, there's a thinking out there that the reason why you're not promoting this a little harder is that it's too expensive for you to produce the water that you're producing so you'd be better off just sitting on the six million dollar that you're getting from the city. No, actually uh, let me just say that uh, I think we have performed as, as the contract actually said uh, when we got here uh, we actually bear all the risk of uh, building the facility and it was actually built with many delays because of the permitting agencies. It was done without costing any dime to the, uh, to the city of Brockton. When it was actually built, the uh, city started paying for it. But I mean, it, it wasn't, uh, it was actually a huge risk that the company uh, uh, took and, and, and we, are, we are taking because to tell you the truth, we are not happy uh, with, uh, with, the way, with the way things are going. I mean, I know the city is not happy uh, because uh, we would like to be selling more water to different communities, to tell you the truth. Let me ask you a question. Um, how much water could you produce with $6 million worth of water? 3.56 according to the firm comment, according to the contract right now. No, that's what it, I'm just saying is that, so if you're, how much water could you, let's, let's not go by our contract. I'm just saying, if, for instance, if a community comes in and says, I want to buy $6 million worth of water, how much water would that be? That's, uh, we, uh, we can produce up to 3.9 right now. We have permitted till five, and we actually done, did an expansion actually last year to comply with the contract, and we'll have to do another one to, to comply with the 4.07. But how are you going to go to 4.07 4 when 
rumor has it that the pipes that you actually laid yeah. do not have the, cap the capacity to carry any more than 3.5 million gallons of water. No, actually we can deliver the amount of water that we can produce till now. We are going to do some repairs on the, uh, on the, on the pipe to go to 4.07, but, but this but is it, not the... Uh, but it is 3.5 right now. Right now we can produce 3.5, three, three and, yes. and the pipes can only carry 3.5. <laughs> No, they, 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 yeah, you have to increase the pressure, yes. It could, it could go, yes. But then it comes back to my question. I mean, there's, we're a city of about 100,000 people, give or take a few. And yet very few people in this community knows that we have that we water yeah. plant. Because, again, there really hasn't been that much advertisement done. I mean, I couldn't talk to my neighbors, my friends in other towns or in other cities and stuff about our water issue or, or the, the abundance of water that we have here in this community because you haven't done your part to well, promote to, that part. To tell you the truth, I mean, most of the population uh, don't know where the water comes from. If you go to Boston, probably most of the people don't know that the, uh, the, uh, the water comes from a, from a reservoir. That's uh, not what I'm saying. What I'm no, saying is that what, the citizens know that they're paying $6 million for water. But it's, it's, they know that they're paying $6 million for water of water they don't see where it's coming from. What I'm trying to get to is that the people, the decision makers of the different towns know that the plant exists. And actually, those are the people that should know that the plant exists. I don't think so, because I, I honestly think that we should all know that the, that the plant exists. Because if we know that the plant exists, guess who forces the decision makers to buy the water, the taxpayers. So if they know that the plant exists, and if you're doing a better job in advertising the plant, perhaps those taxpayers would force their communities to purchase water from Aquaria. And I, thus, we I, 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 I disagree from, I mean, I, I'm getting power today here, and I'm not sure where this power is getting from. I mean, I, I just know that there's light here in this room, and, and I'm not sure where it's coming from. But if I'm paying so $6 million makers, for that power, I better know where it's coming from. I'm, I'm not, I think that the decision makers from the different towns that run along, along the, pipe, the pipeline and can purchase from this plant, they know that this plant exists and that they can purchase from, from the plant whenever wow. they want. Sir, what I'm saying to you is this. Your company needs to do a better job to promote your water from, for the average Joe in the community because you're not doing that right now. The average citizen needs to know that that plant exists and that the water is available so that they can enforce or actually impose on the decision makers to purchase that water. And that's not what you're doing right now because you're not doing that. You're basically doing the very minimum of whatever you can do to advertise. You say you go to these meetings and you have these conversations with these elected officials and stuff like that, but you're not really doing a serious campaign to promote this thing. Because I honestly believe it's because you've got this, you know, you got, hey, you're getting $6 million a year. What is your expenses to run the plant on a yearly basis? More than that. More than that? More than $6 million? Yes, we are losing money every year. We're losing money. You can't be losing money because if you're losing money, you wouldn't be in business too long. I mean, how long? Well, can it's, you it's, it's not a business, to tell you the truth. I mean, I, that's why I'm saying that we are not happy as well as, you, as the city is not happy. I so mean, why if, is it? If that you look at the DPU, uh, at the DPU uh, reports, you're gonna see that in there. I mean, uh, if you if you want to take a look at that report, every single year since we started uh, producing, I mean, since since we actually uh, filed those reports. How many gallons of water are you producing a day now? I think so. To maintain, we are just producing to maintain the pipeline ready to, to go in case the city uh, asks for uh, war the next day. So, but I'm saying you're just basically doing the minimum just to maintain the pipeline. So you're not, you That's can't. Right, but you have to stop the plan. You have to, uh, you have to do everything, every single thing as if the plan was up and running. So why wouldn't you not do more in terms of promoting this? Uh the, I'm this you business. That the, the, the the ones that will be benefit from uh, from joining communities, joining to the plant, it will be us. There was a suggestion from the council in Ward 6 that said, you know, sometimes elected officials listen to other elected officials. Why is it that you and your company is not reaching out to the, to the, to the city that actually has this water to go along with you and help you promote this thing in front of these other communities? Because what some of us are feeling is that you're doing this on the very minimum you know, you're doing this on the very minimum to say, yeah, look, there's a list of uh, places that I went to and spoken to, 
But to us, it's not, it's not relieving that $6 million uh, hole that we face, that, that we, need to, we need to do something to relieve that. So what we're saying to you is that you need to do a little bit more, utilizing the resources that you have in this city, utilizing the resources that you have in your own company and stuff to help you promote this. You can't just keep coming back and say, look, well, I met with this, uh, you know, the, 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 the selectman here and the director here, and that was the end of that. It, that's not good enough. That's not good enough because our, the taxpayers in this community are looking at us saying, are you guys all on drugs or something? Because how can you be paying this company $6 million a year without getting a drop of water, and yet nobody knows that you're trying to do anything to advertise this particular uh, venture so we can get out of this hole? So she offered you, she offered you a, a very good solution to help in the process, but for some odd reason you're not willing to take it. Well, I'm willing to take it. I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not close to any, uh, to, any, uh, to any option going forward, to tell you the truth. So uh, are we going to... We've, we've met with, uh, in the past, we've gone with, the, with uh, personnel from the, from the water department to different meetings from the uh, north of uh, the city of Brockton. And it hasn't helped, but I mean, if, if you want us to do that once again, we'll do it. I want you to do whatever, by whatever means necessary to sell the water. No, to tell you the truth, we have a huge incentive. I mean, the more water we sell, the better we are. And, 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 and if we, we can sell that water and produce water, it's, it's better for us, to tell you the truth. I mean, yes, just being producing just a little bit of water every single day to have the, the plan ready is not helping us. Well, you know what, I'm, I'm gonna leave it here and I think this is my last comment about this. You know what, we need to do more. We're willing to help and do whatever we need to help to make this process go forward. And I think what you need to do is come back to us in a matter of weeks with some sort of a game plan that's gonna be a little bit better than what, you have, what, you, what, you, what you've got today. Because today, all you're basically saying is, I'm trying here, I'm trying there, I'm trying here, I'm trying there, and it's not working out. So I think what I'm going to do is basically ask that you do come back in a, in a couple of weeks and basically come up with some sort of a game plan, how we're going to take this from the point A that it's been in to maybe a point you know, C or D, because we're still stuck on point A. Thank, Thank you, you Mr. Counsel. Chairman. And, and Council, I, I don't disagree with you, and I, I think uh, the gentleman here is where you're going with it. I think um, through Council Sullivan, since he filed this resolve, I think that's probably his intent that we probably hear this again as we, or sometime after the budget process, because I think the mayor needs to be brought into it as well, because he's the one that did make comment last year that he wanted to do something here. So, Council Sullivan. Uh, I just had, first of all, I want to thank you. Council, is that? No, it's okay. Because I know you traveled up from Florida to be here, and I, and I, I it's a distance. Um, I'm happy to be here. Do you, when you go and meet with like Bill Phelan, the town manager over in Holbrook, where I used to be the mayor in Quincy, when you meet with these people, do you have handouts, marketing brochures? Do you bring sample of the water? I mean, I've tried the water. When Units was mayor, myself and Chris McMillan, we drank a glass of it. I mean, do, do you do those things? We prepare, for instance, uh, I'm going to give like you an example. I'd like to see him. I'd like everybody on the council to get a copy of the marketing materials because I think it's important. When we, when we did the pilot plan, for instance, well, when we were doing the permitting, we invited all well, the I mean, when you, when, when you go now, when you go to a Holbrook or an Easton or the, where the best, Bridgewater, the, what do you bring best, with you? The best brochure is actually to invite, the, invite them to the plan and the, because it's actually built. I, invite them to the plan to see the plan up and running. What, what do you give? I mean... You have to give something, a bio, a history yeah. of the company. What do you give when you go to these places? Well, you we, have to give something. You can't just show up and give them your card, general manager. You must give something, right? Okay. What, what, what is it that you hand out to these people? First of all, you, you need to understand what is the, uh, the, the, how, how to get the word to the town. We usually lo uh, look at what, are, what is the, the most feasible option, okay, when someone asks us for, for water. Uh, we look at the different options that they have, the different alternatives. We do the, uh, I mean, there might, there, we may have to build some infrastructure that actually is calculated. I understand that. You're talking about the, 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 the analysis of that specific community. I understand that, right? That's your due diligence of what you need right. to do to vet it out. No, we do. What we, we, work, we work with them. Right. I understand yeah. that. But when you sit down with these people, like Council Dubois offered that, that an elected official would come with you, more than willing to do that. But what is it that you give out? You don't give anything out to these people? 
But you know, course, oh, history of, of the company. Wh wh of course we do. I mean, we have we have we, even we drafted. Get a copy of, could we get a copy of? Sure. Okay, great. And the last question of the night from me. Has the city of Brockton sat down with you recently to inquire about purchasing Aquaria? Have you heard anybody from City Hall that wants to buy Aquaria? We have had discussions in you the have. past. You have. Yeah. And, uh, recently. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Azak. But not recently. We have had discussions on, the, uh, um, on previous years. Thank you. Councilor Azak and Councilor Barnes. Good evening, Mr. Pariente. Um, Mike, you live in Florida, correct? Yes. How are you able to manage the company all the way from Florida? How often are you actually up here? Uh, because it, to me, it sounds like you're really not advertising or doing enough marketing to, you know, to get uh, positive results. There is a project manager. I don't have to be here all the time, to tell you the truth. I mean, I'm pretty much involved because every single week, uh, we, we obviously go over every single thing on the project, but I mean, uh, there is a project manager that is in charge of the, uh, of the project. Do you have somebody that's in charge of marketing that's really trying? Not specifically. We have, some, uh, we have a project manager that is, in, is, is actually in charge of, of the uh, project overall. Okay. You said you have seven employees? Yes. And what are they pretty much? What's their, their overall job? What are they doing on a daily there basis? There is uh, people to do maintenance, there is people to do operation, and there is uh, actually the overall uh, project manager. Okay. So there isn't anybody on a regular basis that goes out that's no. trying to solicit no. to get um, the surrounding towns? No? No. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Council. Council Bonds. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, how much longer do we have to in this contract? When does it end? It's 20 years since 2008. I'm sorry. 20 years 20 since years. 2008. Oh, okay. So some significant time. Yes. Are, is Brockton, the city of Brockton, are we your only client? Mm -hmm. Yes. Just because nobody else can hook up? Yes. How did you find us? No. Well, actually, it's a long story. Um, we, um, the uh, city of Brockton had an issue. They, they, there was a consent decree. Uh, mm -hmm. The DEP actually made the city of Brockton uh, look for a second source, which is actually still in, 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 uh, is still in, in, in effect. Okay. So basically, the city of Brockton needs to have a second source. Uh -huh. Okay, there was a small engineering company, which is Bluestone, that actually uh, started developing this project. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, they they needed a partner to uh, to basically to, to bring the technology and the uh, and the money to invest in this project because the city of Brockton didn't put in any any uh, any money until the project actually was up and running. So a plant there was a plan for a plant, but you needed the money, and Brockton had the money because you said earlier something well, no, no, about no, no. The, um, the Brockton actually uh, the the thing is that you're looking at us as if we are. Here, the the bad guys. I mean, we are we we no, were the no, guys. No, but you did say earlier, though. Excuse me, if you don't mind. You did say earlier something about uh, you start, they started building the project and then collecting the money to pay for the project. You said something along those lines no, no, earlier. No, no, no. we haven't. No, the, what what I said is that the contract that we have with the city of Brockton, yeah, uh, the city of Brockton didn't have to put a dime until the plant was operational. Until the, I'm sorry, I, I didn't and the pla and the the plant started going online. Uh, until the plan was operational. Up and running, uh-huh, yeah. okay. So that was, I mean, when, when the uh, city of Brockton uh, looked at the different sources, they looked at, the, at, at NWRA. NWRA was more expensive because they had to pay money up front, they had to do some investment, and uh, Aquaria actually proposed a plan that was going to do all the investment and charge money whenever, they, uh, whenever we uh, finish the project. What so happens if we default on the contract and just don't pay? You can't. You can't. You can't. But you get sued, council. You get sued. The council back then gave up their rights to. Oh. Anyhow. So so okay so we're, we're everybody's just having a bad time because you all aren't making money. We're paying for something we can't use. Everybody in this whole deal is just just really oh, to, to, in a bad to, yes. bad way. Oh, I think yeah. they are. To tell you the truth, I'm, I'm I mean. My company, or actually the uh, parent companies of Aquaria, are not making any money on this project. Money. Are, are you losing. breaking even? No, they are losing money every year. Oh. Okay. All set, Councillor? Council Thank Bond, you. Council Thanks. Um, I recently spoke with the elected water commission from Rochester. I may be pronouncing it wrong, but it's a southeastern mass town, and they have us on the horizon. 
Um, they've thought about Aquaria. I'm sure that they would talk to you. Um, they're an elected board. Every time I see the guy, I try to sell him the water myself. But they don't ha need it right now. But so I'm assuming. But he knows because he's a water commissioner that they're gonna need it someday because everybody knows that we're gonna need more water as time goes on. So, will you reach out to them? And is there any way that you could put together some kind of strategy where you would assist municipalities with laying the pipe and somehow p deferring costs in order for them to buy into the potential like Brockton had to do? Have you given any thought of that, helping communities buy into the potential that everybody well, we, knows we is coming? We actually build the potential. I mean, we have a pipeline that is larger than the, uh, the contract that we have with the city of Brockton. Mm -hmm. So the potential, the... Uh, but, but Dighton is here. No, no, I know. Brockton I know where, is here, and yeah. I think Rochester is like here. It's actually uh, west of uh, Lakeville, west, southwest. So you, they would have to build a pipe probably from yeah, Dighton. We'll have to look. I mean, that's that's a community that we haven't actually talked to because it's actually quite far to uh, from... Yeah, I wasn't sure, but I know that they know. They're, they're talking about us, I know. and they're, they're hearing about the expense and they know that they're going to need it but it just seems like this whole project is like 20 years too soon to be profitable here and so in 20 years when brockton has no stake in the game all of a sudden it might be profitable and it just seems like a big scheme i i have to say i would have helped you if i was a city council because i would have voted against this i would have voted to go to the mwra because i think it would have cost us like six million dollars to hook in and right now we're paying like 120 million dollars over a 20-year contract and this isn't your fault but because the city was boondoggled into thinking that somehow this plant is cheaper than the mwra which is difficult because now you're up against selectmen who are representing small towns who are faced with the same math equation and they're making the proper equation. Maybe they're using a calculator and the people here were using an abacus when we made this <laughs> deal because it just, they're seeing that it's not financially viable. Don't so I, I don't know how to get out of it. Thank you so okay. much. Chairman, I want to make a motion to postpone to the first FinCom in July. Second. Motion's been made. Second, just on the motion for Council Azak, she had no I, question. You stated um, earlier that you're losing money. You're not even breaking even. Right. Do you have, what are your plans? Well, I mean, how long can you keep on losing money in a company? Well, we have, I mean, we have a contract with the city. I mean, and uh, we are sticking by it. So if mutually you're losing money and we're losing money. That's right. We gotta work together. Can't we work together to either break the contract or do something? I mean, I, I'm a business owner, and if I was losing money constantly, I'd find a solution. I mean, and I mean, on both ends, we're losing money. It just, it's just not making sense. So if you're honestly, lo you're truly losing money, then I think we, we should find a solution to it. I agree. Okay. Thank you. Just a quick quiz. Everybody knows where the hookup is and where the turn on switch is, right up on Pearl Street and Ward yep. 3. Okay, one more three. Into it. That's exactly right. Motion's been made. <laughs> Second to postpone. All in favor? Opposed? Postpone to the next step. Uh, Mr. Chairperson? Mr. Condon, before you leave, do you, do you have any guesstimate on when the budget books are going to be ready? Okay. Okay, thank you. Councilors, as I said earlier, uh, and I sent an email out, June 9th, which is a Monday, 10th, 11th, 12th. We're gonna try, like we've done in the past, to get everything ratified in the first, first three days, but we will have the fourth uh, night if needed. Um, the agenda will be sent out, we're working on it now. It'll be very similar to last year's in terms of the department heads that will be reporting, but you will have it soon. And as Mr. Conan just said, we'll have the books in a timely manner as well. So I think it gives us enough time. I did speak to the mayor originally. We were thinking, I was thinking as, as president to do it June 2, 3, 4, 5. But um, after speaking with the mayor, he needed a little more time to speak on the school side. So we give him an extra week out of courtesy to see if we can get some more money. But ultimately, that is a firm date, the 9th, the 10th, the 11th, the 12th. Mr. President? Also, Stuart had something to say. Just a point of personal privilege, please. Absolutely. I just want to acknowledge that the Brockton Garden Club had a really fantastic weekend in their annual um, plant sale. I believe they raised more money in the history of the organization this year and brought in lots of interested people from outside of Brockton into the city and, of course, uh, energized lots of Brocktonians. So congratulations to the Garden Club. 
Thank you. Mr. Mr. President, Council. I have a question for you. Do you know, will we be having a public hearing this year on the budget? We will be. I need to speak to con uh, Legislative Council. Thank you so much. I suspect that we will be. I appreciate that. And then just to tag on to Councillor Stewart's, I was there. It's my favorite thing of the year. I spent $100, and I got more flowers than I can even plant in the ground. Councillor Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. A uh, moment of personal privilege yes, as well. Sir. Never used it. Let me give it, give it one shot. Wait, this is, come on. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just want to... Um, uh, I went to the, uh, to the play at the high school uh, over the weekend, and... Um, I'll tell you one thing, I, I couldn't be prouder than the, the children and the, the young people that we actually have in the, uh, in the school system from the, from the <clears throat> teachers to the supervisors and the, the dancers, the actors, the folks backstage, front stage, side stage. It was just an unbelievable event and I, I, I would not feel good about going home and not actually you know, leaving a shout out for those, uh, for those young people. I mean, I've been to a couple of Broadway shows, but you know what? We had Broadway in the, you know, this weekend in the city of Brockton, so they should all be congratulated for doing our city proud, and I'm very proud of those kids uh, over the weekend. Thank you, Councilor Council Monaghan. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, moment of personal privilege, please. Absolutely. Uh, just I'd like to have a moment of silence for Richard Smith, a former plumber in the city of Brockton who uh, passed away uh, this weekend. Thank you. Councilor Cruz. Thank you. I uh, just want to let the public know, the, uh, particularly the residents of West Elm Street, that on uh, May 28th at 6.30 at the West Middle School, they will, the residents of West Elm Street will receive registered letters, but there is a meeting about the uh, work that will be commencing fairly soon on uh, West Elm Street because there will uh, need to be temporary easements and in some cases permanent easements taken. There will be an informational meeting run by the uh, state uh, DPW uh, and the city DPW. So uh, anybody has any questions, they can give me a call. Uh, anybody can come, but it's mostly for the residents of West Elm Street. Thank you. Councilors, I uh, had the honor and privilege to go to the 50th birthday party the other night of our good friend and former colleague Chris MacMillan. The ward, former Ward 7 Councilor, but I also went to a more important birthday party, my son William Robert Sullivan, who was age two, and we had a birthday brunch with him. He's asleep, thankfully, right now, but uh, I want to wish Billy a happy birthday. Would you watch this meeting and put him to sleep? <laughs> Anything else before us tonight? Meeting's adjourned.